Mr. Mayor, you are ready to begin. Okay, good evening. I'll call to order the special council meeting study session of November 10th. Before we get started, I'd like to remind council and participants of some procedural items for this meeting. During the meeting, council and participants will remain muted when not speaking. If council members or participants have a question or comment, please use the raise your hand feature. Uh, speakers will then be called upon one at a time. This city council meeting is being held conducted utilizing teleconferencing and electronic means consistent with state, state of California executive order N-29-20 regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. Members of the public may provide audio comment by connecting to the teleconference meeting online or by their telephone and use the raised hand feature to request to speak, star nine on your telephone. Teleconference meeting details can be found on the council agenda. Comments on the study session must be submitted prior to the time I close public comment on them. Following the study session, the regular city council meeting will begin at 7 p.m. We encourage the public to stay tuned and watch our regular meeting. With that, city clerk, may we please have the roll call. Mayor Klein. Present. Vice Mayor Smith. Present. Council Member Larson. Present. Council Member Hendricks. Attending. Council Member Melton. Present. Council Member Goldman. Present. Council Member Fong. Present. Seven present participating via teleconference. Thank you. First up is item 20-0052, Sunnyvale Clean Water Center and Plant Rehabilitation Update. Is there a staff report? There is. Uh, Chip Taylor, I'm the Public Works Director, um, and so tonight uh, we're talking about those two different items. We have the Clean Water Center, which is essentially the administration and lab building uh, over at the treatment plant, um, as well as the plant rehabilitation update, uh, which is the plant rehabilitation is um, uh, repairing and refurbishing part of the plant, uh, one of our big projects in the overall program. Uh, tonight, um, uh, Allison Boyer, our Assistant City Engineer, uh, we'll give an overview of kind of where we're at with the program right now with some of our projects and where we're going. Talk a little bit about the architecture of the Clean Water Center um, and talk about a little bit of a shift that we're looking at uh, based on some budgetary constraints that we have to potentially focus on the rehabilitation uh, rather than the Clean Water Center. Um, and then Ramana Chinakotla, our Environmental Services Director, will talk a little bit about um, some strategies to potentially capture some savings that we had from some of our uh, loans that we received to potentially continue to move some of those uh, other projects forward, including the Clean Water Center, and some of the advantages and disadvantages of the approach that we're looking at. And then I'll wrap up at the very end. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Allison Boyer to go through the project. Allison, I believe you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> you think I'd know that by now. Um, okay, well, uh, as you guys are all aware, we have a clean water program here at the city of Sunnyvale. The master plan was adopted back in 2016 and it includes 30 new projects that would be implemented by 2043. So that's what's shown here on the screen. The items in solid colors are those that are currently budgeted and in the 20-year uh, budget. And then those that are in green are the ones that were not um, budgeted when the master plan was adopted. So currently we have one project under construction, the primary project, and three projects under design. The secondary there in that tannish color the clean water center in blue, and then the rehab project in pink. And then we have a site prep project that falls under that with that secondary that just gets the site ready for all the construction. So last time, I think, oops, too far. Last time you guys were out, there was a big hole in the ground, but since then we've made a lot of progress at the site. So here's a quick snapshot of what the primary project looks like right now. We had some PG&E issues that have been resolved and wastewater is scheduled to begin flowing through these facilities um, starting summer of 2021. Secondary uh, treatment and dewatering is our biggest project coming up here. It is the centerpiece of the program. Our plant currently uses the ponds as our secondary treatment. With the new secondary 
uh, thickening and dewatering, we will turn to a more mechanical system. As per the master plan, we will be in split flow. So all the water will come through this new primary and then go into split between the secondary facilities and the plant. And then we have our existing plant rehabilitation, which is on the eastern half of the site, where we're where we are planning on keeping what's what needs to stay in. Um, sorry, stay uh, working through this split flow condition. So it's our ter our secondary and tertiary facilities. Um, we had a condition assessment performed back in 2017, which gave the facility these uh, specific features five to 10 years. So with these rehab project, we're hoping to continue the service life of these facilities. And then one of the main points we're here today, last time, uh, I think you guys saw this project, we had the admin and lab building on the household hazardous waste site. That time we had discovered that the site was in unclosed landfill and we were looking to explore new alternatives with the intent of hoping to bring down some of the costs. So we did a, a utility, uh, I'm sorry, we did a, re, a utility relocation study and we looked at moving the administration and lab building to the current administration building location. And at that time we realized it was best to combine the admin lab and maintenance building into one facility and we coined it the clean water center. So moving forward, that's what we, what we are referring to. It includes the admin lab and maintenance building. So here's our latest 60% rendering of the, the site. You have our clean water center there in the center, some new staff parking, our uh, perimeter wall and site security fence. And then just a little bit closer view in. And then what we really wanted to show you today are the two options that we were, we've um, come to start evaluating. We had an architectural concept one shown here. And then we have our preferred uh, concept, which is architectural concept number two. Um, at this time, this is the design that the staff is planning to move forward with to for 90% construct uh, design documents. However, as uh, Chip alluded to at the beginning, we have some cost control uh, items that we need, to, we have to work out as the overall program. Um, focusing on our adopted budgets, the 330 million is what is currently in our uh, 1920 budgets. That includes those three projects that we discussed, the Clean Water Center, the secondary and the rehab, the projects currently in design. So between the 30% and the 60% design, we went through, we looked at scope, really scrutinized what was going on. And um, unfortunately the cost estimates at 60% came in higher than we were hoping for at 383 million. Um, we did put in a lot of focus and scrutinizing the scopes and making sure that everything we are including is necessary and identified in the master plan. So with that, we kind of came to a fork in the road of either staying on budget or and reducing the scope or staying on scope, but increasing the budget. And at this time, based on minimizing the risk we were we, and staying on budget, um, we decided to defer the clean water center. So I will pass that on to Romana with that. Thank you, Allison. Um, so, uh, in terms of what we are looking at as a path forward, uh, you see all these nice colors on this on this um, slide here. Um, the yellow piece, which basically we call it, the, what we are wanting to proceed with is the secondary treatment. And also it includes the conventional activated sludge system and also the solids handling facility. And both are required because we need to meet the new permit regulations. So that's uh, of the portion that we are proceeding with. We also uh, are planning to proceed with the existing plant rehab project. And again, um, the big um, driver behind that is to make sure that uh, our existing plant is still able to operate safely and also meet all permit regulations. Uh, 
uh, and also make sure our staff are safe um, and our operations are stable. So those are the pieces that we are proceeding with. And then um, the green boxes that you see is kind of part of the site prep, which is kind of required to be able to do the other two pieces. Um, so the piece that we are differing um, is the clean water center, the, the piece that you see in blue. Um, next slide, please. So um, what does differing the clean water center mean? Um, what we basically mean is that we are going to complete, we are going to complete all the design all the way up to 90%. Uh, we will prepare and reserve the site itself. So the site will be ready for us to go forward and uh, bid out and start construction when we are ready, when we have the money. Uh, we will also construct the recycled yard parking lot, which is the staff parking lot uh, on the other side of Call Road. Um, and then we basically, when we are able to find savings on other projects, um, the, the projects that we basically identified earlier, um, when we bid those out, um, we may be able to get some savings. Um, we also are seeking additional grants. Um, there's an sort of loan that we'll be applying for very soon. Um, so that will present us additional savings opportunities that we can tap into. Um, next slide, please. So um, what we're doing essentially is keeping our options open um, and basically want to have the cake and eat it too. So we want to be able to see if you're able to get savings from the other projects. And as you can see from the schedule, um, all the other projects, the biggest, the, the projects that, that is the longest in terms of time frame, is the secondary project. Um, that's going to start in the second quarter of 2022 and go all the way to the middle of 2025. So you have a number of opportunities where once these other projects, the, the site prep project, the wall project, the pipelines project, and the secondary project, all these are going to be bid much before the clean water center. So um, the clean water center, the piece that you see in uh, on the last row, you have the opportunity to move the project forward or delay the project and still be able to complete it um, on um, time at the, by the time the secondary project is complete. So you have other opportunities to tap into those, any savings that we might realize from these other projects. Um, next slide, please. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of these, of differing the Clean Water Center? Obviously the biggest advantage is that we are staying within the um, city council approved budget. We are basically prioritizing the projects that are more critical to the plant um, and basically keeping our options open on the Clean Water Center. Um, the other big advantage is it by choosing the existing plant rehab project over the Clean Water Center, we are reducing the risk of treatment facility failure. Uh, the biggest risk, and you all know this, we've basically had a uh, pond effluent pipeline failure recently. Um, and we were lucky that uh, the, the pipe that broke carried water that was almost fully treated and um, it didn't discharge directly into the bay, uh, but we may not be that lucky next time. So we wanna focus on things that are very critical to our plant operations. So that's why, um, that's one of the big advantages of doing of, of this approach. Uh, some of the disadvantages, obviously costs go up the longer we wait. So we basically run the risk of actually uh, increasing the cost of the Clean Water Center if we delay too long. Uh, the, the way we've structured this project now, our maintenance facility, we will not, no, we will not have anymore once the primary treatment project is complete. So we will be moving the, the maintenance um, staff and the facility to a temporary facility. So we're gonna be having a lot of staff sitting in temporary facilities for a while. So um, if we do that permanently, obviously it hinders uh, our recruitment and retention. Um, we also uh, stand to lose any savings we may be able to get from our RIFIA loan um, if we permanently defer the project. Um, uh, the VIFIA loan that we've obtained covers 49% of our project cost. 
and it's uh, for $220 million. Um, so it, if we take exclude the Clean Water Center, then you kind of lose out on those savings. Um, the other aspect of the interest savings that the low interest rate environment that we currently are in, it may not last. So that's the other disadvantage of deferring the Clean Water Center too far uh, down the line. Uh, but again, I think we have structured this uh, in a way that we still keep our options open. And um, I think in February, we'll come back to you with a more defined analysis of some of the costs, um, you know, after we account for some of the interest savings and other savings that we might accrue. So I'm gonna turn it back to Chip. All right, and I'll wrap up here with some next steps. So, you know, since we're trying to improve the fiscal situation or apply for grants and save some dollars that might be able to go back into the program, uh, we're intending to proceed forward uh, to 90% design on the Clean Water Center. So it's basically ready to go and we can jump on it as soon as we, uh, if we have the opportunity or we get some favorable bids. Um, we're going to proceed forward with the rehabilitation project. So we intend to kind of focus on that and get that moving forward uh, within the overall budget. Um, on December 8th, you'll see the uh, state revolving fund application uh, for kind of some of our next phases. Uh, so it'll be another low interest loan that can save us some overall dollars in the program. Uh, in February, we'll come with a much bigger program update, a little bit more details, uh, February 23rd, as Ramana uh, alluded to. And then of course, this is a capital budget year. So we'll be readjusting all of our budgets uh, and moving things around a little bit between uh, various projects. And then it'll come through the normal budget process um, um, and would we'll get approved in June of next year. Um, and then in March of 2022 uh, is on the books is to start um, a master plan update. So it's a pretty typical process to update the master plan and kind of adjust as we found things. Uh, so that would give an opportunity to adjust everything at that point in time um, and, uh, and uh, get us uh, on a different track potentially for that. And with that, um, I think we're done. That's our last uh, slide there. Uh, and we're available for any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to start off, uh, what direction are you wanting feedback on the general slides you know, at this point for, for tonight? I, you know, I think we, we've, we've kind of set a path forward that we intend to follow. So it's certainly if there's any feedback on that path or concern about that path, that's what we would like to hear. Okay. And I had a few questions, uh, one of which was the two alternatives for the Clean Water Center, uh, your preferred and, and non-preferred options. What's the cost differential between the two? And from what I was looking at from the plans, all I could see was kind of an extension of some of the windows on the second floor, but maybe you can maybe you can itemize a little bit more about what the differences are between those two options. That that really is the main difference is the the windows essentially extend all the way up to the ceiling, and that gives us a little bit more daylight into the uh, building, a little bit more lead points that way versus more of your standard window, standard office windows there. Um, and then I'll look for Allison if she has any data on it. Was there any sort of big cost difference between those two? Not between those two. Um, as Chip mentioned, it was mostly the the windows there. It is a south facing uh, building. So we were trying to be cautious of the sun and the heat and glare that would come in from that, which would affect HVAC and everything else um, that connects to that. So the big thing that we were looking at was those windows and still giving the daylight that comes in from the floor to ceiling windows and having that open uh, pitched roof and um, feel to it without uh, cutting off the daylight. Okay. And then as far as the temporary structures that that are being proposed uh, for in the interim, uh, where will those actually be located or where are they located? Yeah, yeah I'll let Allison, uh, you know, you, you, I don't know if we have a map up, but Allison can locate those for you. Yeah. So when we start our secondary uh, project, the secondary thickening and dewatering building, that dewatering building will be placed on top of what is currently our maintenance building. So um, we need to relocate the maintenance staff. And as you guys know, it kind of becomes a jigsaw puzzle as we work our way across the site. 
So now that we have our new primary facility up and running, we can demolish the existing primary sedimentation tanks. And we plan on using that area as lay down construction trailers and a temporary maintenance um, spot. And it's kind of in the kind of in the middle of the site, really. Like kind of in the middle. Of the yeah, site. pretty much. If you where the right behind the current admin building, that area. Okay. That, yeah, it's just north of the current admin building. Okay, and then as far as um, the the lost in the interest savings, you know how we we have no idea how long um, if as far as the delay is concerned, how much we end up losing and all that from from that standpoint. You know, from a timing, what, how, how, how critical is the timing as far as moving this forward and losing those savings? Well, I think you know, as Ramana and Ramana might be able to speak to this, we had that graph that showed where we could slide the clean water center over a little bit, so we had a little bit of time during that secondary. So we've got some of that opportunity to move. So it's a, it's a, it's a year or year or two years that we can kind of slide it a little bit uh, before then we would have to essentially kind of uh, forego that portion of the WIFIA loan. Um, and it's and it's that savings for that difference between like the 190 and the 220 million. It's just that 30 million dollar savings and in interest that you would have essentially not 30 million dollars in savings and in interest, but the interest on the 30 million that you would save. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, we basically have until the end of 2025, really, to to be able to complete the clean water center. So that's still a you know it typically takes about a year and a half to probably build a building of that size. So we do have some flexibility there. It's just that all these are part of the WIFIA loan. So by the time we complete all the other components, if you're able to complete the Clean Water Center, um, then we'll still be able to take advantage of those low, those low interest savings. So the drop dead date is basically middle of 2024. 2020, yeah. yeah. Roughly. Uh, roughly, roughly, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go ahead to other council member questions. Uh, first up is council member Larson. Thank you, mayor. Um, so my first question is about the site prep because it looked like that was a, a big component of the, the budget change. Um, and it looked like that was something new that was not in the original budget. So can you tell me more about what the site prep is and what caused that to be added to the program? Yeah, I'll hand that to Allison. She knows the details. So it's um, basically split out of our secondary project. It's not necessarily new work. It's stuff that we're putting in its own construction package to get out ahead of that secondary project. So it includes rerouting all of the utilities at the front end of the plant, demoing those primaries, the sedimentation tanks, setting up the maintenance, uh, temporary maintenance facility, the contractor trailers. It's getting everything ready so that as soon as the contractor for secondary comes on, they hit the ground running. So it's not new work. It's just been split from the uh, secondary package for the most part. Okay, uh, that makes sense. Just repackaging. It's repackaging. Yeah, add, um, if I may add something, the, the main reason why the biggest, the cost increase is really because of a lot of surprises that we were uh, we basically found out as we went through the design phase of the of the rehab project. So the condition assessment that was done um, underestimated the actual cost of what that was going to be. So as we went through the design, then we had a lot more information or the designers had more information. So we were able to get a better sense of what those costs were and they essentially doubled. Uh, so we went through this whole process of actually going through the, the entire scope and whittling down the scope um, to stuff that we really, really needed. And the other stuff was just kind of cosmetic. So even with that, we're still over budget. Um, this, that's one. And the other one was just the bid market factors, which is just the market. Um, you know, the costs just keep going up. So we basically wanted to make sure that we accounted for those in our budget estimates. So those were the two key reasons. Okay. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that. And I can certainly appreciate that discovering unknowns uh, happens more often than we would like in any large project when we finally get in there and, and uh, have some surprises. We just don't know what they're gonna be. Um, so if you were to look into your crystal ball um, 
for how long it might take to come up with funding for the, the clean water center, whether it's, I, I know you, you it's hard to speculate on cost savings on bids, but it sounds like there are other funding sources that might be available, grants, loans, et cetera. Um, can you give me a sense of like, is that something that is gonna take years and years to materialize or is something that you think you can get a handle on pretty quickly? I, I think it's a combination. I think that we're, we're actively working like on the state revolving fund on the WIFIA, we had a better interest rate than we thought. So there's, there's some potential capture of that, of that savings that was built into the budget that we might be able to shift back. So that's something that we're actively working on. And then the bids are a big component of it as well, right? We've built in these bid market factors. We've built in these pieces. So we certainly hope that there's an opportunity to capture some of those dollars when we, if we get some good bids back, we won't quite know that. Um, as far as other opportunities, we'll certainly look at, you know, future uh, cycles for, uh, for WIFIA and for state revolving fund. And I'm not sure if Allison or Ramana, if you have any more details on any one of those two pieces. Yeah, so the SRF loan, we're actually applying in December. So that, that's something that we applied for a cycle back and we just lost out by a few points. So we're, um, hoping that we'll be successful this time. Um, the, uh, the other projects, they're all going to be bid out in the next couple of years. So, um, so we will know in a couple of years if we will actually get savings from those projects. And the biggest one, obviously, is the secondary treatment. That's, I think, around $260 million or something like that. So, so even a 5% savings there is a huge number. Uh, so, but we will know those in the next couple of years for sure. Okay. So a couple of years to find that out. Yeah. Cause I, you know, I, I would hate to uh, lose out on the low interest environment that we have now and also um, have con um, escalation of construction costs yeah. um, drive that up. So anything we can do to like bring that in within a couple of years would be awesome. Um, and then my last question, just a little, um, tiny little thing. I, I noticed on the pictures of the, um, the clean water center, the architectural pictures, it looked like there was a flood wall in front, but there was a gap in the flood wall where you go up the steps to go into the building and it almost looks like, well, the first time we have a, a flood, the water is going to go right in the front door. So how is that being taken care of? Well, we have some really fancy gates that Allison is designing. So they actually, there's hydrostatic gates. So when you want them, they actually close, they come up and rise and close up. So, and they protect, they become a wall, basically. Good. I, I, I was certain that you had thought of it and had a, a great solution, but it's just nice to hear the details. Yeah, That's they're all actually, I yeah the, the gates are actually kind of neat as the water flows, it kind of pushes it up. And so it's, it's actually a very uh, intriguing process on how it works. Oh, very nice. Cool. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Council Member Hendricks. Yeah, thank you. So you're asking the question of you want to hear from us. Do we have, I do I approve of your strategy? And yes, I approve of the strategy of deferring this other work um, to go ahead and get what I'll call the hardcore water processing work done. So I'll start there. What are the functional implications of deferring the clean water center? I mean, I've heard about here what it means to staff, but functionally, what does it mean to the work they'll be able to accomplish? And I'll probably hand that to Ramana to answer more operational. Um, in the short term, um, it'll just be inefficient because we'll just have staff in many different places. Um, but operationally, it won't really affect the plant um, in any way. Um, the admin building is the, you know, is the location where everyone uses restrooms. So the restrooms are not in great condition. So we may have to, from a functional perspective, need to spend a little bit more money on upkeep and keeping things running. And if something fails, uh, we need to make sure that, you know, we have some backups for those kinds of things. Uh, but other than that, other than incon inconvenience for staff and um, maybe some HVAC issues and things like that, um, no major operational impacts. Okay, so um, maybe in the future, I'd actually like to be able to understand and be able to quantify more of what this inconvenience is. And I'd really like to understand the long-term implications. You'll see that 
um, when I ask one of my future questions. Um, on slide 15, it looks like, am I reading it right? We're somewhere around $53 million short. Is that the issue? Yes. Okay, yes. so that, that's the ballpark of what we're talking about. Um, okay, so Kent, this is for you. So it seems to me what is being teed up here is a future policy question. It's not a quite, you know, we've already figured out how we're going to deal with this in the short term, but it seems to me the future policy question is, is we're just hoping for cost savings of to the tune of $53 million plus, or you're either going to come back and ask the council to increase the budget for this project, or we're not ever going to do the clean water center. I mean, I, I, that, that's what I'm really hearing is the nuts and bolts of uh, what this presentation is. Am I understanding correctly? I mean, that's a good summary. I think the piece that you left out was if we can achieve savings in other ways, like through financing, that we could recapture that. And although we may ask to spend more money on construction, the total outlay for the city would be less because we have savings and financing costs. So that's another part of it. Well, um, well that, 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 that fits into the overall cost savings kind of you know, yeah. piece. It's either we're going to find a way to, to, to do all this stuff with the money that's, that you know, Tim's got in his back pocket or you're gonna to have to ask for more money or we're not gonna do it. Yes, generally, yeah. And, and so, and, and that's where I started with, I agree with, I, I'm for, let's do the hardcore water, you know, treatment stuff work right now. But what I'd actually like to know is, you know, what's the timing of in the future? Cause I realize we're not at being asked to make that policy decision now, but you know, is that 18 months away, 24 months away and, just, you know, how we're going to be able to, you know, where does that line up on our agenda? I, you know, the biggest, and, and I don't have the exact date, but Allison could chime in. When we open bids on the secondary treatment process, that is the largest project in the plant um, clean water program as a whole. So when we open bids, you're going to see either good news or bad news. And if it's good news, we'll have enough money to do the clean water center. If it's bad news, we're going to be looking for all kinds of ways to just get that essential project done. Okay, so that's kind of the timing. If I went back to the other chart of the, yes. I'm just trying to get to, you know, here, like I said, I think you're making the right decision right now, but, you know, keeping us apprised of how we're getting moving towards this other future policy decision um, and stuff, I think that's going to be important to, you know, the steps along the way for that. Um, Thanks a lot. I have no other. Well, you know, Gustav asked a question about when the wall closes. I assume there's also going to be a way when that's closed that people can still get in and out. Is that correct? You don't have to open the wall to let somebody come or go, right? Not really, unless you fly them in. <laughs> okay. The main reason why we have it is for flood protection. So we're assuming that there is a flood at the time. So what you're doing is you're protecting the infrastructure inside the plant from the flood, so. And then those people, whoever is in there is gonna stay for 24, 48, 72, 96 hours straight. Yes. And that's just the deal. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, great, thanks. Um, good job on what you guys are doing. You know, this is a difficult question we in the future have, but great job on everything you guys are doing to keep things working, thanks. Thank you. Uh, next up is Council Member Melton. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Hey, okay, great. Um, so. Just to pick up on a question from council member Hendricks, because I saw the same thing, $53 million higher. And right now we just don't have the budget for it. And so at some point we're gonna be out looking for solutions, but Ramana, I heard like three or four different reasons that were $53 million over. And we also have 40 different projects that we're working on. So could you just resummarize for me is it site prep that's causing us to go over? Is it condition assessment? Is it bid market factors? Um, so connect the dots for me. Well, yeah, even though we have 40 projects, the projects that we're referring to right now, um, we basically have four. So one is the site prep. The other one is the secondary treatment, which is by far the largest of, the, of all the projects. Then we have the existing plant rehab project. Um, and then the Clean Water Center. So out of these, the biggest gap in funding was mainly because our existing plant rehab budget 
what we budgeted when we basically got your approval to what it is currently stands as far as the estimate, it's basically more than doubled. Um, it was around 35, 36 million. It basically doubled to around 70 million. So we've been able to bring it back um, in terms of the, by reducing the scope, but that's one big portion. Um, the site prep is really just a new project we created by taking elements of different projects. Um, it's the piece that need to, needs to be done. So we are ready for the other projects. So uh, things, for example, building the wall goes into the site prep in a way because uh, you can't build the wall and other things at the same time. So you got to get it out of the way first. Utility relocations have to be done first before we do other elements of the project. So that's the site, site prep part. The secondary treatment project also um, grew in cost. Um, and most of that is because of really big market factors. So those are the key, key areas where uh, our estimates are now higher than the budget. Yeah, and um, so just two comments. And um, by the way, Kent, I'll have many, many more questions for you offline at our next meeting to help me fully understand this. But um, the, the bid factors are quote unquote, just estimates, Romano. And obviously we don't know what the bids are until we quote unquote, open the envelope. So it's great that we're doing estimates, but those are just estimates right now. And reality may prove as Kent said to be favorable to us. But then also you, you mentioned the plant rehab as the biggest sort of culprit of where the overage is coming from. Um, and those are actual projects that have been happening and don't we have contingencies built in to those projects or have we just overwhelmed the contingencies? Well, no, I mean, this is basically, um, usually contingencies are around 20 to 30%. Um, this is more, I think, pretty much double the actual, what we estimated in the condition assessment that was done by the consultant. Um, it's more a result of when you start designing things, you actually start looking at things more closely. Um, and then once you design them, you get a better sense of what the cost looks like. So I think it was more of a, you know, as you look closer, get closer to the design, you get much better estimates. So our estimates will be off when we did the condition assessment. That, that's fine. That's I can fine. add Guys. a little bit to that. Yeah, I can add a little bit to that. The, the uh, you know, the rehab project, these are new projects, not the ones that we're currently working on. These are new ones that were in design. And it, and it kind of goes back to when whenever we do any sort of rehabilitation or remodel type work, like we're doing over at the DPS building, um, we always have a higher contingency because you never know once you actually get in there what you're going to find um, and whether it's going to meet what the condition assessment um, uh, showed or whether it's going to be higher. And that's always the problem with these rehabilitation type projects. Okay, that's that's helpful, Chip, to hear. So let me, let me just shift gears here. Um, so... I heard staff say that we're gonna just go ahead and plow ahead on the clean water center to get to the 90% design. That's something, Chip, we would have done anyway. We were already set to just go ahead to 90% design. Um, so when would you think that we would get to 90% design? Is that something that's six months away, 12 months away? How, how far away are we from 90% design? I think it's within the next six months. Is that right, Allison? Yeah. Okay. And then um, what's going to happen on the February 23rd detail project update? So that'll be an update of the overall uh, program uh, for clean water. And we're going to dive in deeper to not only these issues, but a lot of, but the whole program. We're looking to potentially move some things around based on what we've learned and that sort of thing. So it's going to be a, a much more detailed version of what you're hearing tonight as well as even more than that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next up is Vice Mayor Smith. Yeah, thanks. I uh, agree with the direction that has been being presented. I did have a question about the, the WIFIA low interest 
loan savings, losing those. Is that because we won't be financing the clean water plant as we had anticipated? Or is there something else that I'm missing? No, that's essentially it. The, the, the portion of the clean water center that was included in WIFIA, if we don't do the clean water center, we wouldn't finance that piece. Okay. Okay. And those, um, that would be an, ad that is not rolled into the 53 million, I take it, because it's the shortfall is, so basically the result of that would be restarting it later would be more expensive. Okay. Yeah, exactly. As, as costs go up just over time, then the, the, the clean water center itself could become more expensive. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's all I had. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next up, Council Member Fong. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the great presentation. Um, I, I got the two questions you're asking. I, before I answer them, I just have one question. So uh, the, the condition assessment that was done by the consultant that's the reason why we're over budget is that the estimate was incorrect. So as part of like the master planning process, there was a condition assessment that was done, you know, several years back. Um, and based on the data that they had at that time and the information they had at that time, that's what they had estimated. But then as we got more, more detailed data, when you get into detailed design and whatnot, um, more things were discovered that needed to be uh, resolved. Oh, and so it raised the price. It's just like I was talking about like the remodel. When you open up the wall, sometimes you don't quite know what you're going to find. Yeah, dry so rot have... and all that. Okay. Exactly. So, exactly. so it's not necessarily the consultant's fault. It's just unforeseen things we found in the project. I just want to make sure because if we hire the consultant again, I want to know the name of the consultant, right? So just to make it very clear, it was not the consultant's fault, it seems. It, it, they, these are common type things when you're doing master plan you're very high level looking at these things and then when you dig down deeper sometimes it's cheaper sometimes it's more expensive just depending on what you find there great and then the, the last question i have is so so i'm fine on the architecture design too that you've selected since the cost is the same makes sense get more light in um the second question of, of is the plan okay it really seems like we're you're asking the question you know do you want to gamble now and defer the actual office space, essentially, and hope that we can find the funding for that to cover the cost later, which will ultimately, yes, the construction costs will go up, but the project will be lower than if we went ahead now and use general fund money or something to, to fund that. Is that the question that you're really asking? Yeah, basically, we're, we're saying let's let's focus on the main purpose of the treatment plant. Let's make sure that that's solid. And then the office space, since we know that there's a lot of unknowns, there's some bid opportunities to save some money. Let's get that ready and see if we can capture some things. And then if, if we can, great. If we can't, then we might come back with another conversation on that. And then February, we'll have an even more in-depth conversation about that as well. But the plan is to focus on the core treatment of, of wastewater, essentially. Okay, got it. And, and, and I'm supportive of that. I, I, I just ask when this is brought back in February that the, the finance team brings to us, you know, these are the two options and this is the estimated cost savings between the two options. Do we go ahead now, use general fund money and this is how much it costs and this is how much we save if we get it done by 2024, we get the $30 million from WIFIA, et cetera, or do we push it out and we can find X amount of money? I, I would really like to know more clearly what that looks like. And, and I get a lot of it's, you know, will be out of your control to be able to estimate, but that's the kind of like data I would like to see when, when making a real decision on this. But, but I'm fine, I'm fine to go ahead with the plan now, but uh, that, that's just the feedback that I have. So, so uh, I, I don't know if that kind of answers your question. Yeah, no, no, I, I, that definitely we're going to, you know, proceeding forward as we have planned. I think that, you know, one of the things we have to note is that this is within the wastewater fund. And so it's rate payer based. So it's not necessarily general fund, oh, okay, so okay. more based on the rates. So it would then potentially affect future rates or, you know, near term rates. That's the biggest key that could be a driver related to this. Um, but yes, thank you for the comment on, on proceeding forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Councilmember Goldman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Klein. I uh, really had more of a comment than a question, which was that um, I was reviewing uh, state-sponsored, um, uh, state uh, official documents 
on the uh, vulnerability of various um, uh, wastewater treatment uh, plants near near uh, near the water uh, in, in context of sea level rise. And this one uh, came out pretty well. Uh, they was one of the better ones. Uh, there's some others which are in danger. Uh, I want to uh, second the idea of waiting. I, I'm particularly concerned about the uncertainty. Uh, there are a whole bunch of uh, programs uh, related to the um, financial uh, stress and situation, which will expire uh, at the end of this year. And we have no idea what's going to happen then. We also don't know if uh, what the uh, uh, new administration will do. Uh, maybe there will be this massive stimulus uh, plan, which will uh, raise interest rates and uh, get everyone working and also raise revenues. And we have no idea. So even waiting, so even waiting just one year will add, a, I think, a lot of clarity to this. But I do want to, again, uh, compliment staff on, on doing really good work. And I completely agree on, on uh, holding off a little until we have more insight into this. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, you're yeah. muted. Got it. Thank you very much. That's all the questions from council. Uh, since we remain in a virtual setting, I'll ask the public to use a virtual raise your hand button or dial star nine on your telephone to indicate that they wish to speak. The city clerk will then ask you to unmute your microphone when it's your turn to address the council. City clerk, do we have any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? No, Mr. Mayor, no one has raised their hand indicating a desire to speak on this agenda item. Okay, thank you very much. Does council have any last questions? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to our next item. Our next item is item 20-0851. Review this, uh, sorry, let's get this right. Yes, uh, review the solid waste franchise collection proposal. Is there a staff report? Yes, there is. Thank you, Mayor, council members. Um, I also want to introduce our team that's here today, uh, Peter Deibler um, from HFNH and um, his colleague, uh, Mona Lisa Noor, who is going to be helping us with running the presentation. Um, also wanted to, I'm very happy to report that Mark Powers is also um, helping us on a temporary basis, um, helping drive this project forward. So I'm very glad that he's back. Um, and Karen Gisabel, who's our uh, Solid Waste Programs Manager is also here. Um, the study session today is to just give you, uh, the council, um, an update on where we are on our Solid Waste Franchise Collection um, contract. Um, next slide, please. Um, the topics that we'll be covering today is um, we're going to be giving a little bit of background on um, what got us here and a recap um, on, on things that we have done this year um, since we last came, came to you. Um, that'll be followed by an overview of um, the specialty proposals um, and then the city review and analysis of the proposals. Uh, and then we'll have, we'll outline the next steps uh, and then um, we will basically take any council questions or feedback. Next slide, please. So um, just to give you a recap, one of the biggest drivers um, that's basically changing our solid waste industry is the Senate Bill 1383 regulation. In fact, we just got word that the final regulations were finally approved, final, final. So um, the, 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 the bill essentially targets a reduction in what we call short-lived climate pollutants or um, which are basically methane related emissions. And the goal behind this bill is to achieve a reduction of 50% um, of organic waste by 2020, 75% by 2025, and also introduce new edible food recovery programs that will um, increase uh, edible food recovery by 20% by 2025. Um, next slide, please. So the timeline for this Senate Bill 1383 is that we have to put new 
um, the regulations take effect in January of 2022. So we have to put in pro place the programs that will get us there by that time frame. So this collection contract is very timely in the sense that we need to we were able to basically put all these programs into the contract. Um, the local enforcement actions um, are required to commence in January of 2024. Um, and then the 2025 and the 2025 goals for organic disposal and edible food recovery um, are all basically by 2025. Um, next slide, please. So the key milestones as far as this contract goes, um, in December of 2018, almost two years ago, we came to you and um, we basically gave you the performance review of specialty. Um, and you directed us to conduct a sole source um, RFP process. Um, we came back to you in February of 2020 this year um, and we shared the draft RFP with you and you gave us um, you approved that and we released the, RF, the RFP. Um, specialty submitted their initial proposal in May of this year. Um, and after further discussions between the city and specialty, they submitted a revised proposal in September. And then the last two months we've spent um, doing further negotiations with specialty on some of the contract uh, you know, terms and mainly the scope of what we wanted to do in terms of the different programs. Um, and that brings us to today. Next slide. So I'm gonna stop here and then I'm gonna turn it over to Peter. So he's going to give us um, the overview of specialty proposals and um, city Fairview. Thank you, Ramana, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the council. Can you hear me okay? okay. Yes. yes, we can. Great. So there are four key components to the proposal from specialty. Uh, base services is what we call uh, the name we give to the existing services that you now uh, enjoy in the city, residents, uh, commercial businesses, multifamily, et cetera, collection services. And then as Ramana mentioned, uh, this very important role that SB 1383 is going to play moving forward. So the proposal uh, fully addressed uh, a range of services that need to be provided. We'll talk a bit more about as well as support uh, or ancillary services related to that. And then enhanced services are a few things that um, either we asked for or that through the RFP or specially offered to provide um, in addition. And we'll touch on those. Next slide, please. Thank you. So continuing based services, this is really just a very quick overview of the services that are now provided to customers. So in the lower left corner, you can see the color uh, legend for different types of material, garbage, food scraps, recyclables, yard trimmings. And uh, for single family, you can see you know, garbage and food scraps, as you know, through the food cycle program are collected together. Recyclables and yard trimmings are also part of the residential uh, single family service. Multifamily right now, uh, there, there are no food scraps collection occurring, uh, but you have uh, garbage recyclables and the option uh, to subscribe to yard trimming service. And similarly for commercial, uh, there there's a mandatory garbage collection, but there's partial uh, or optional participation in food scraps, recycling programs, and in the yard trimming service as needed. Next slide. Thank you. So the circles there are the SB 1383 service additions. So these are the three big drivers of cost moving forward and service changes uh, with all the impacts that that will mean. As you see, they're really centered on multifamily and commercial customers, single family. Uh, essentially, you have the programs in place to be compliant with SB 1383. But the major additions will be a new food scrap program for multifamily um, and then a expanded uh, commercial food scrap program that will cover need to cover all businesses, not some. And finally, a requirement under 1383 
that there be some sort of yard trimming service. So that could be through the contractor or it could be a landscaper or whatever it might be, but there has to be something in place. Next slide. So turning to the support services that uh, fit into those new collection programs. One is expanded technical assistance to these types of customers. Uh, and Romana touched on the fact that there is a compliance aspect to SB 1383. Um, the company has proposed to new staff to lead the outreach and compliance management efforts related to the new services for 1383. And uh, there's also edible food recovery program support that they're proposing. Next slide. Finally, that fourth category were the enhanced services. These were the other things that have been proposed. Um, and the first one is multifamily bulky item collection, which would be expanding the current single family system um, to multifamilies. Downtown service would be about providing ways for um, providing better access for collection in some of the new areas with dense development, particularly where you have residential and commercial mixed in buildings. We can talk more about that if you like. Uh, and then expanded use of technology, uh, both for efficiency of operations and for communication uh, between the customer service functions uh, performed by the company and by the city. Next slide. And finally, several other enhanced services. Um, the company has proposed to upgrade its CNG fueling station and to add what's called slow fill. There's fast fill and slow fill means of uh, fueling trucks. And this would uh, add uh, more flexibility uh, for the company. Then shifting over time to uh, in terms of fuel to uh, recover natural gas as a source, and that will dovetail with requirements under SP 1383. And then finally, providing uh, for a transition over time when it's commercially viable uh, to do so, to shift to electric vehicles uh, when they're available for these types of heavy duty uh, applications. So next slide. Okay, and final slide on the initial proposal. These are some offers that specialty uh, made to the city. Um, they would be maintaining the same profit level, but they would uh, propose a freeze on executive compensation uh, on facility rent charges to the city, even though rent might go up over time. Uh, they've captured some savings through change of credit card vendors. Um, there's an owner contribution towards the food recovery program that would be of uh, available potentially to uh, not-for-profit uh, entities engaged in that activity. Uh, no profit on interest charges to the city, and those add up to an estimated combined annual value of about $80,000. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to shift over now to um, the city's review and analysis of the proposal is submitted. And as Ramonda mentioned, uh, we, or we are in the process of negotiation. So you'll see as we go through this, uh, it's very much a status uh, as uh, in terms of where we are in each item. So the, um, we've been looking at whether the proposal addresses RFP requirements. And yes, it does. Uh, whether it's accurate. Yes, it is. Uh, the accuracy is particularly important because we're talking about complicated cost proposals uh, and projections of costs and assumptions underlying those costs over a number of years. So we've worked hard to really understand those. They provided the requested contract term options, which were seven years and 10 years. And we are working on the last two areas. Fine tuning of assumptions is really uh, most importantly, the assumptions underlying how the new services will be rolled out or the expanded services to comply with 1383 requirements and uh, costs, how the costs related to that will fall and, uh, and how they will hit the rates. And then reviewing the reasonableness of costs themselves. Um, 
it's important to say that we have really been um, in the city city staff really driven by uh, the fundamental understanding that between the time the RFP was released in February and proposal was received in May, a major thing occurred, which is the virus. Um, and so there's been a desire to really understand the proposal well and understand what kind of costs could either be eliminated or deferred uh, to really help minimize the impact to ratepayers. Next slide. So what are the key cost drivers? Um, so an important point is that the compensation model is, is what's called cost plus. And this means that the company, uh, uh, to the extent that they incur expenses, they uh, receive profit based on those expenses. Um, this model works very well for Sunnyvale because uh, it requires an annual compensation review process, but that also provides a great deal of flexibility to make changes uh, in programs and will be extremely beneficial for SB 1383 in terms of really being able to understand what needs to happen and to make adjustments. So the key drivers are replacing existing trucks. So regardless of SB 1383, over time, trucks would need to be replaced, carts and containers would need to be replaced, et cetera. There's a capital cost to doing that. Um, there are some labor cost increases under a new uh, labor contract that um, I believe went into effect in July. Um, and then the capital and labor to add any new routes and to add any spare trucks or equipment that might be needed related to the expanded services. And finally, the profit margin is a driver of cost. Next slide. So regarding the assumptions, um, this through discussion with the company, this is, uh, we have a, a shared understanding, I think that uh, first of all on base services uh, and actually the truck life would apply to any truck, um, that the default assumption is that a truck lasts 12 years rather than 10. We're not gonna replace them immediately. We have the capability and the company certainly has the capability to track uh, maintenance costs for individual trucks and understand you know, where that sweet spot is, if you will, of when an individual truck should be replaced. And also to stagger the replacement to minimize the impact in any one year. Similarly, um, we looked at containers carefully and came to the conclusion and I uh, agreement, I believe with the company that the yard trimming carts in particular uh, can last really 14 years. Uh, they have the least wear and tear probably of the types of carts that single family residents use. And again, to reduce the impact of that by staggering their replacement over time. Next slide. So looking at the SB 1383 services themselves, this is really the crux of what, what makes sense in terms of how many routes need to be added. By a route, I mean how many, uh, how many new trucks essentially need to be added because of new customers and new containers that are going to be collected in each of these three areas, the new multifamily food, expanded commercial food, and yard trimmings. Um, we revisited or visited all of these assumptions and had quite a bit of back and forth with the company, focusing most importantly on the number of accounts. The account is essentially a stop. And so if you're driving a collection truck, costs are really driven by primarily how many stops you're making uh, on a given day. And uh, so we have uh, agreement on those assumptions for starting really uh, in year one of the new services, which would be uh, fiscal year 21, 22, and then into uh, you know, the beginning of 1383 services. Next slide. So turning to the enhanced services, if you remember, these are sort of additional bells and whistles that um, have um, various advantages. So the multifamily bulky item, I think if it were any other year, perhaps we would be recommending that that be something where a pilot would be done in the first year and look and see how the program would work. But because of the complexity of rolling out SB 1383 and because of the role of COVID, we felt it would be useful to postpone this for some period of time. 
because of the nature of the agreement you have, the council could always say, well, in year three, we'd like you to look at this now, or in year two, it could be changed if need be. The downtown service will be provided on a subscription only basis. So if a customer uh, needs it, they will pay for that on a one to uh, separate uh, arrangement from the rate structure. So in other words, rate, uh, rate payers would not be impacted by that service. The expanded use of technology and the fuel station upgrade are two key areas where we are still under review. Um, working with the company and understanding the options, understanding what kind of costs potentially could, again, either be eliminated or deferred um, in each area. Thanks. Next slide. Okay, so the latest cost proposal. First, I want to mention uh, just a quick little bit of background. This is compensation to specialty. It's not the same as the rate impact. The rate impact is lower, and we'll touch on that in a moment. Um, but with the latest cost proposal, we're down to about a 10% increase in year one from current. So the 100% uh, column on the left represents the 2021 compensation under the current agreement. And the 110% would be uh, fiscal year 21-22. However, I want to add a note here, if important note. So, we are focusing for now on year one costs because, uh, again, because of the structure of the agreement and the past agreements you've had with the company, uh, costs are reviewed or compensation is reviewed on an annual basis. So there's really the opportunity to fine tune what needs to happen in year two, uh, three, and four. And in year three in particular, um, the intent is to do a more comprehensive review where we'd really look at, okay, we're a year and a half or two years into providing these new services for 1383. What does that actually look like on the street? What are the needs in terms of trucks, et cetera? And then also, because we're moving, ideally, the whole purpose is to move material out of the garbage stream, uh, food scraps and other organic materials. So over time, there should be a reduction in the solid waste stream and that may allow for efficiencies there uh, and fewer routes that can be put into effect. Next slide. So the items still to be addressed or negotiated uh, mentioned the approach to technology in the fueling station, um, the operating ratio, which is a way of, it's a, a measure of profit that's used under the contract. Um, the agreement term. So as I mentioned, the company responded to the RFP uh, which requested a seven and 10 year terms, um, pricing for each of those lengths. Um, there are advantages to 10 years over seven in particular, be just because of the, the way equipment is depreciated, it reduces costs. Um, we've also had some discussion of uh, potentially something like a 15 year term, and that might be a 10 year term with a five year extension. Uh, that might not be quite automatic, but is an option. Um, and we'll be looking at, at that to see if that's a benefit to ratepayers and to the city to, to have that sort of uh, arrangement. And finally, there's some other contractual business terms, the, uh, the items where we need to get the attorneys in the room to uh, finish, uh, finish that part of the deal. So next slide, please. Okay, so the negotiation objectives, um, as I mentioned, um, is a succinct way to say it is really to avoid sudden impact to ratepayers. So we've really tried to reduce, eliminate, or defer and sort of smooth costs and smooth rate impacts as much as possible. Um, we're gonna add mandated services first. So that's SP 1383. We don't really have a choice. Um, and then defer, defer other services that might be deemed optional. Next slide. So rate impacts, how does this translate? Well, there's roughly uh, the specialty compensation uh, is roughly 50% of the solid waste rate revenue requirement on an annual basis. So if you're looking at approximately a 10% increase in costs, that's approximately a 5% increase in rates uh, that would occur across the board. 
However, um, our goal is to, uh, we've been able to reduce that quite a bit so far in terms of first year impact and staff's goal is to get down to a 4% increase. And with that, I'll turn it back to Romana. Thank you, Peter. So next steps, um, our goal is to complete uh, negotiations with specialty by the end of this month. Um, and then we uh, can meet with council members one-on-one -on -one if uh, so desired. So we can discuss cost and services in more detail um, because this is still a negotiation. Uh, we did not purposely share um, actual costs with you or cost details with you. Um, but we can do that at a one-on-one -on -one setting if that's required or that's desired. So we plan to do that in December and January. Um, and then hopefully by the last council meeting of January, we hope to come back to you um, with uh, for council approval of the execution of a new franchise and agreement. As part of that, we will also be requesting the first year compensation, which is a compensation that would translate to increased costs uh, for fiscal year 21, 22. Um, and then once we see how the SP 1383 programs pan out, how many customers actually um, sign up, and um, we have a better understanding of those costs and how many new routes we need to implement, we plan to come back again in early 2022 with um, a year two compensation request. So this allows us to kind of take it slow uh, and focus on what we need to do first, but also as we get more information, then we can tailor the new programs to that information. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just another way of showing you the same information. The key thing that I wanted to point out is that um, the big uncertainty is we don't know how many customers we will actually have once in terms of multifamily organics and commercial organics. And the big reason for that is you can essentially, a customer can request a waiver uh, if they don't have enough space to actually have store a cart or a store bin. They can request a waiver if they don't have enough, if they're not generating enough organic waste. So there's all those details we still don't know. We have close to 3,000 customers that we need to basically audit. So that's the part that we realize that we need to do right away. So specialty has started the process of auditing the customers, um, potential customers for these services right now. So um, once we award the contract, um, we will still continue by that time, by early spring, we will have an idea of exactly how many customers we will have. Um, and then during um, from spring and you know from that point on, we will start a lot of community outreach um, in educating and informing those customers on how we plan to roll out those services. Um, and then July is when specialties new contract or collection agreement will commence. Next slide, please. So that um, concludes our presentation. Um, we'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, and receive council feedback. Okay, thank you. Um, first, you know, I, I want to thank you for the presentation. I think council will have tons of questions on this. So, you know, from from that standpoint, you know, I do think that uh, the the offer of council member one on ones will be useful uh, because there's the devils in the details as far as this, this contract is concerned, and. There are a lot, of, a lot of previous direction given by council that is somewhat captured here, but, but I have you know, tons of questions. Uh, I'll, I'll just grab a few questions and I think it's imperative that we start looking at uh, scheduling council member one-on-ones to go through the laundry list of questions that I'm guessing my colleagues also have. Uh, just as a few high level questions. You know, you talked about um, multifamily, and one of the assumptions was um, for multifamily food collection, reduced assumed new accounts. And I'm guessing that's because the concept of a waiver and 
you know, they don't have a place for it. Is that correct or, or we just don't know? Well, there's a combination. One is we don't um, really have a good understanding of how much organic waste some of them may generate uh, because we're not collecting their waste right now. Um, it's kind of part of the solid waste collection. So some apartments may be small enough that they don't generate enough organic waste to qualify or to require um, organics collection. Uh, the other part is, like you said, is they may not have enough space to actually have a separate bin or a cart for collecting organic waste. So we don't know those details yet. So that's why the uncertainty in the participation rate. So on that note, and I'll, and I'll I, we've been talking about this for years and as far as, you know, where an organic, where a food cycle can, receptacle would go in multifamily. And, you know, even today, I don't think we are, we are working with any of our pr pr prospective developers on, on adding that into, into sites. So, you know, the concept of what are we going to do has been discussed for a long time. And now, well, the, the landlord doesn't have a location and we didn't have the fourth, fourth thought, you know, even I've been talking to developers just recently and ask that specific question. And it's like, well, it's not being required by staff. And, and so I, I have a little um, issue with the concept of immediately applying waivers and saying, well, the majority of multifamily can't do this because they don't have a location there on site. And so I do think that we need to force that from a certain standpoint and figuring out from a program standpoint how we move forward with that. Because ultimately, we know that there's food cycle there. And when we talked about it previously, whether or not specialty or any service could, could separate food post uh, collection, and I guess that that has been ruled out that we want to, and it's always easier to re redo, remove it uh, and divert it earlier in the, in the, in the line. Um, I, I just have a question as far as how reasonable is that at this point? So I do want to clarify that um, as part of our, all of our development reviews, that's a very, very critical component. So all the new complexes, we have already for the last three years, ever since we started our food scraps program, every single new development has the ability to basically collect and separate food waste. So we're not gonna have any issues with any of the recent uh, apartment complexes. Okay. Um, so we, we actually have planned for that and we make sure we actually review that. There is a trash management plan that every single complex has to come up with. So our solid waste staff reviews that and we actually tell them, hey, you are going to have to separate food waste starting this date. So you need to plan for it. So, so that's happening, uh, that's been happening for the last three to four years. Um, oh, okay. Uh, but it's mainly for the older, really old complexes that uh, you, you may have issues. Uh, but again, we are committed to actually collecting food scraps. It's the question of rollout and the timing of the rollout is what we're talking about. So the, when we talk about the difference between what specialty is proposing and what we are proposing, we are saying take, it'll take three to four years for us to do everything or you know, not three to four years, but we're doing it slow versus they want to basically have uh, buy all the trucks today and start all the routes immediately. And what we're telling them is, let's do it when we are confirmed that we have X number of customers. Okay, and if, if and so I'll, I'll leave most of my questions till later, but since we brought up that, you brought up that question, how many trucks do we think are needed if, if that program is fully installed? Because we were always talking previously about $250,000 a year per truck approximately. How many additional trucks? Uh, I believe it's seven plus two. So there's seven new trucks and two spares. Uh, Peter, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that correct or is it eight? Yeah, that's correct. So to Ramana's point about 
uh, just deferring some of the expenses. The idea is to have, um, I believe, three new trucks or it's two new trucks the first year, three the second year of those nine, and then to have the, the other four happen in year three or four. But again, with the flexibility to understand really beginning year two, as well as year three, what the real needs are based on the ground. So okay. it, rather than, fun, I think the original proposal had seven new uh, trucks happening in year one and year two. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I have a laundry list of questions. I think, you know, I'll save them for the next one-on-one. -on -one. I do think, you know, it's important for, from a state standpoint and, you know, local standpoint of how we negotiate this contract. And I'm hoping that, that uh, we have enough information to give you in the, in the next month as negotiations continue that we're not letting anything fall through the cracks and you're getting, getting appropriate feedback from council. Uh, so with that, let me go to my other council members. Council member Hendricks. Yeah, thank you. And hopefully I'm gonna be able to keep my comments away from anything that's actually part of the negotiations. Um, first off, yes, I'd like one of those um, one-on-one discussions. So specifically, what is anything gonna change for our residential customers? Um, not in terms of operations, um, because our single family homes already have food scraps. Um, so we've already met Senate Bill 1383 requirements. Okay, so, but as part of this new thing, we're not going back and revisiting any of the aspects of the food scrap program and the concerns that residents have had? So that's that's continuing. That's not part of this, this contract itself. Um, I know you have raised in the council. Okay, okay, well, uh, let me just go ahead and say in my one-on-one -on -one discussion, if we say it's continuing, I'm not aware of anything that's being done that you're saying is continuing. So I'd, I'd like to have that. Um, and I think we're going to have to have more communication. Um, you know, getting down to the end, you talk about in the spring, we're going to start communication to our residents. And then in July, things start. That just doesn't seem like enough time to me. There are a couple of us council members that have been here that have been, I still hear the number one issue that residents have has to do with our garbage and the program. And so I, I just think, and, and I'll, I'll jump to the end. One of your negotiation objectives needs to be how we're going to handle communication to the residents. I mean, that, that, that has to be a big, huge thing. Pretend I'm, ba I'm banging my hands on the table and stuff and being really loud. If there is one thing I learned on seven years of being on the Sunnyvale City Council is that residents really, 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 really care about their garbage stuff. And if anything's going to change, or in this case, something's not going to change, we have to do a really good job of communicating to them in advance. Otherwise, it just means the seven council members hear about it everywhere we go. So I, I hope I'm being crystal clear on that particular point. Um, in the one-on-one, -on -one, I'd like to be able to get more information about how the labor contract is negotiated because that just seems, seems to be a pass-through cost to us that we have to go ahead and deal with. Um, on the SB 1383, it'd be nice, I, I don't want to make extra work, but if we could somehow keep and separate out what that's costing, um, I'd like to be able to explain that to our residents and I'd like to be able to explain that to Sacramento. Um, you said the rate impact was somewhere, you know, four or 5%. What did we put in our, um, when we do our annual budget and approve the rates, we do projection out. What's in the projections for the next two or three years for rate increases on garbage? Does anybody know? I'm going to take a guess, but I think it's down 2%. Okay, so right now what we're talking about would be doubling what is there in the projections. I see Tim showed up. <laughs> it's uh, currently uh, 11222 for the remainder of the 10 years. Okay, so it, it, again, I'm going to go back to communication. Um, and then... Um, you know, back at the beginning of this process, the council directed to do a sole source. And, you know, we talked about here, let's do that, you know, and if everything goes great, then that's the right path. Or if, you know, things aren't working, we can go somewhere else. I'm assuming things are working out very well. Is, is, is that correct that we're, we're believing that the sole source uh, direction for this was correct? They're going in the right direction. Yes. Okay. So, so that that path was the right path of what we want to do. Yes. And then I, I'm going to close on um, communication communication, communication, and I can get more detail to you if you want about what that is. 
but I cannot overstress the need for communication with our residents about what's going on. And I did have one other question on the multifamily. You said that's where a lot of the costs are. Um, when we have one-on-ones, can you break out what, you know, why is that more expensive and what those costs are? And are we assuming that if it's multifamily stuff, those costs are going to show up in the multifamily rates, or are we going to be trying to somewhat spread that across all the rates? I can get into that one when, when you meet yeah. them. So, but, um, you know, other than my communication issue, I'm, I'm happy we're, we're, we, the sole source is working and we're trying to get to the right place. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Melton. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Klein. Hey, Ramana, can you just um, help refresh my memory? The, the difference between what we do today on food cycle, which we've been doing for a couple of years now, and SB 1383 is essentially rolling out food cycle to multifamily residential and businesses. Is that a correct statement? That is correct. Um, okay. We do have... Um, organic services to some of our commercial, some of our big, larger businesses, but now um, almost every size of business is now part of SP 1383. Yes, understood. Um, so here, here is my policy statement. In the city of Sunnyvale, I want max SB 1383 achievement via max food cycle the mostest, the fastest possible. And part of what drives my policy statement is that food cycle in Sunnyvale has been an outrageous success. It's been a success in terms of reducing landfill away from the landfill and it's helped us lower cost to our customers for um, garbage collection. And council member Hendrick spoke very eloquently about lessons learned in terms of communications and behavior change and you know what we need uh, people um, to think about doing in terms of creating a successful program. So for me, the number one thing I'll be looking for in the contract, and I'd like a one-on-one -on -one session as well, is how will everybody work together to accomplish the massive outreach program that is going to be required to implement the behavior change that will lead to the self-fulfilling virtuous cycle of success that we previously achieved on food cycle and even turbocharge it because now we've learned the lessons about communication, outreach, and behavior change. Um, so, so that's how I look at all of this. I think um, the negotiations seem to be going very well. For example, we're getting into nitty gritties on things like replacement schedules and depreciation schedules, Peter, of trucks and the green carts, and that's all fantastic. Keep working on that. Um, in, in Southeast Sunnyvale, where we have a lot of um, uh, multifamily residential in terms of bulky item collection, I saw that that was a potential new service. And I lament the fact that it may need to be pushed out to year four, because I think that's something that uh, multifamily residents in Southeast Sunnyvale could certainly take use of. Um, so maybe something sooner than year four will ultimately come to fruition. But um, for right now, I'm focused on SB 1383 food cycle, the mostest, the fastest with massive outreach. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Council Member Fong. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Ron, for the great presentation. When is the current contract up again? Because I know that you're, is it June of next year? It expires in June of next year. Okay, so the timeline is, is you know, you negotiate through January, it looks like um, the TMAC has it on the 26th, is what you're shooting for, right? Sure. And then uh, you're hoping to implement that by June, right? Yeah, I just wanted to also clarify that even though the contract begins on July 1st, none of these new services are set to begin until January of next year. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, we actually even, you know, the, the community outreach and all the other stuff that we are going to be doing, contacting businesses is going to continue from actually right now, we've started the process right now with the desk audits all the way until end of next year. So, the services don't actually begin on July 1st. 
the contractor will be doing their base services, which is their normal collection services, starting July 1st. But the new service will begin in January 1st of 2021, uh, 2022. That, that's great to hear. Uh, we have a little bit of time to, to, to roll out a program, assuming it's in the package. Um, and I'll just echo, you know, Councilman Hendricks and uh, Melton's sentiments about having a communications component in the actual contract. You know, the city will do this, you will do that. Um, and I would also love a one-on-one, -on -one, um, obviously closer to when you're finalized. It doesn't have to be this year if you don't get it done this year and it's early next year. Um, uh, but the other question I had was just about following up on Mayor Klein's um, issue with the multifamily. So in one of your responses, you mentioned the plan is to get this rolled out to existing multifamily in what year, four years from now, or what, what was the timeline on that? So the, the program will start January 1st of 2022. For multifamily, existing multifamily? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And when will it start for new multifamily? It sounds like it already has, sort of. Well, it's all, all multifamily. All multifamily. Oh, okay. Okay. So all is, is okay. Got it. So um, how do you actually see that happening though? And I don't know if, if this is a question for Trudy, but how does that work when they have, you know, an existing apartment building has a certain setup are they going to have to be required to do construction and, and take away a parking spot to be able to increase the capacity? Like, I don't know how that works. So, so how do you actually see that being implemented? So Senate Bill 1383 gives options for apartment complexes and businesses to request a waiver if they show that they basically cannot accommodate um, an extra cart or a bin, or they don't really have a practical way of of accommodating the additional requirements um, as required by Senate Bill 1383. So that's why the process is more complicated than just basically saying, well, you're gonna do it versus actually having to go visit the complex, meeting with the management, um, looking at their current um, trash collection facilities um, and working with them to see if we can actually make, find a way to work, make it work. Um, and we've, we've had a lot of practice with this, with our commercial big businesses, uh, because each of them actually provides, uh, deals with trash differently. So we've had to work and it's a very um, elaborate hand-holding process that we have to go through. So um, uh, in terms of communication, that's the reason why specialty is adding two new staff members specifically to work through this, this process. And then we are supplementing that with our own staff. So, but the goal is to work one by one with every apartment complex to make sure that, you know, we have a path that, that allows them to provide these services. If they don't, they request a waiver. We go through the analysis. And then if we are satisfied they, that they don't have a practical means to do that, then uh, we give them a waiver. Okay, and, the, and the last part of my question, and then and I can move on from this, is, is so for that, when they request a waiver, does it go to the city or does it go to a state department? It goes to us, but we have to file that with the state. So, but we're, okay, we're the middle person. So, so in my experience in the past year, it seems like whenever Sacramento does something, we are allowed to go stricter. And I don't know if that's a question on a policy basis. It, can we actually require stricter requirements for the waiver than currently laid out by the bill to, as, as to basically try to increase solid waste collection? Well, the city council can always go stricter than the regulations. I mean, so, so that would be an interesting question for the council, whether it's, a, and it would, I don't think it could be a study issue because it would have to get decided soon. Maybe it could, but it, I just wanted to flag that for my co colleagues that I'm very interested in that is, is if, if we're trying to get this actually rolled out in existing multifamily and I don't, I have to look at the bill, but the bill has regulations where it's easy to get a waiver, the city could look at making more stringent uh, regulations. And, and so I would be interested to hear that in my one-on-one -on -one with you, Ramana, later, 
and maybe Trudy should be there and, and you know, can the city say, oh, you can get rid of this parking spot and we'll make some kind of amendments to your, you know, I, I don't know how it works with zoning and everything and land use. So, so uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Hendricks. Yeah, just to follow on, I think with what Council Member Fong was just saying right there, I don't think it's, I, I'm personally not interested in necessarily creating stricter regulations. I think it's going to come down to the implementation specifics and the site specific issues of whether or not they can implement what the regulations already was. And I think that's kind of what um, Mason, I, I don't want to speak for him, but that's where I think the issue is going to be is, you know, here, is it implementable? Not necessarily do we want to set a higher level of standard. And I saw him kind of shaking his head. So, okay, cool. Okay. Seeing no further questions from council. Uh, since we remain in a virtual setting, I'll ask the public to use the virtual raise your hand button or dial star nine on your telephone to indicate that they wish to speak. The city clerk will then ask you to unmute your microphone at, when it's your turn to address city council. City clerk, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? Yes, Mr. Mayor, we have one member of the public, Jerry Nabon. Jerry, you'll have three, you'll have three minutes to address the city council and we've just unmuted you. And so your three minutes will start momentarily. All right, you've been unmuted. You're free to go ahead, Jerry. Good evening, city councilman. Um, I'm the operations officer for specialty solid waste and wanna thank you for taking the time tonight. Um, we've had a long negotiation with staff and um, appreciate during this COVID time, um, how hard it's been and how Hard they've worked to get this done. Um, I want to thank Nick Nabhan, who's done a lot of work to get this done, and um, and the staff that's our staff that's helped along the way. Um, well, the one concern that I've only I have right now is that uh, this starts January 1st to 22, and we need to get the trucks ordered soon. So I hope this gets going because it's right now about a 14 month long process to get a truck ordered. So I hope that the timeline on this goes quickly. So um, that's pretty much all I wanna say is thank you for the time that you all put in on this. Okay, thank you, Jerry. And thanks for what your team does. Mr. Mayor, that was the final speaker on this agenda item. Okay. I see no further questions from council. And so I, I urge council to go ahead and set up those one-on-ones with city staff if they have further questions. With that, uh, we will adjourn the special meeting at 6.56. Please join us back here at 7 p.m. Thank you.
Mr. Mayor, we're ready when you are. Okay. One moment. Okay, let's call to order the council meeting of November 10th. Before we get started, I'd like to remind council of some of the procedural items for this evening. Uh, during the meeting, council members and participants will remain muted when not speaking. If council members or participants have a question or a comment, please use the raise your hand feature. Speakers will be called upon to speak one at a time and a random order of voice vote will be administered by the city clerk for each vote. This, this city council meeting is being conducted utilizing teleconferencing and electronic means consistent with the state of California executive order N-29-20 regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. Members of the public may provide audio public comment by connecting to the teleconference meeting online or by telephone and use the raised hand feature to request to speak star nine in the telephone. Teleconference meeting details can be found on the council agenda. Comments on matters not on the agenda must be submitted prior to the time that I call that item for oral communications. Comments on agenda items must be submitted prior to the time I close the public hearing on that agenda item. Speakers request to keep their comments to no more than three minutes and time limits will be strictly enforced. Guidelines are posted on the city's website and on the council meeting agenda. With that, City Clerk, may we please have the roll call? Mayor Klein. Present. Vice Mayor Smith. Present. Council Member Larson. Present. Council Member Hendricks. Attending. Council Member Melton. Present. Council Member Goldman. Present. Council Member Fong. Present. Seven present participating via teleconference. Very good. Uh, next is a special order of the day for picture book month. November is National Picture Book, book Month, a time to celebrate one of the most cherished forms of children's literature. Picture books have always been one of the largest and most used collections of the Sunnyvale Public Library. During these unprecedented events of the past year, picture books have continued to be one of the most popular requested items, with families taking home bags filled to the brim with picture books to share with their children at home. Picture books have given us some of the most treasured moments in children's literature. Many of us remember giving a mouse a cookie, sailing to where the wild things are, or falling asleep in a great green room after saying good night to the moon. Through picture books, parents and caregivers share these beloved childhood moments of wonder, as well as new luminous stories with their young ones. In honor of Picture Book Month, I would like to share a short film celebrating what makes picture books so engaging and loved by children and adults alike. City Clerk. Hi, Sunnyvale City Council. My name is Lori and I'm a youth services librarian at the Sunnyvale Public Library. I'm here today to talk to you about picture books. There are so many reasons to love picture books, but we asked our staff to come up with the top five reasons they love picture books and some of their favorite titles. The first reason we love picture books is they sound great when they're read out loud, like this bedtime favorite, Goodnight Moon. We also love picture books for all the great messages they contain for young readers, like this one by Dr. Seuss, The Lorax, which has lots of great messages about caring for the environment around you. Another reason we love picture books is they can help young readers understand their emotions better. And one example of that is our favorite, Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus by Mo Willems. Pigeon is a little bit angry, a little bit impulsive, a little bit frustrated, and I think we can all relate to pigeons sometimes. We also love picture books because they are often told from a kid's point of view, like this favorite from Ezra Jack Keats, The Snowy Day. We also love picture books because they contain beautiful, eye-catching illustrations, just like this one, The Little Mouse, The Red Ripe Strawberry, and The Big Hungry Bear. That's one of my favorites. So those are our top five reasons that we love picture books, but November is not just picture book month, it is also Dinovember. And so with that in mind, we'd like to share a short film we made called How Do Dinosaurs Say I Love Picture Books?
Fantastic. Ah, okay. Um, through our outdoor and appointment services, our Sunnyvale Library continues to brighten the lives of children by making these wonderful books and many others accessible to families. On behalf of the Sunnyvale City Council, I declare the month of November as National Picture Book Month in the city of Sunnyvale. And congratulations to all these Sunnyvale Library employees who, who work so hard on the video and, and keep serving our, our community through uh, these extraordinary times. Thank you very much for your service. And with that, uh, next up is oral communications. Members of the public will now have an opportunity to address council on topics not listed on tonight's agenda. This section is limited to 15 minutes and may be extended or continued after the public hearing uh, section of the agenda. Individuals are limited to one appearance with a maximum of up to three minutes per speaker. A reminder, reminder to the public, please raise your digital hand or dial star nine on your telephone if you wish to address city council. The city clerk will then ask you to unmute your microphone when it is your turn to address city council. First up, of course, however, is uh, council member Goldman with a few public announcements. Council member Goldman, you're muted. I'm sorry, Mayor Klein. I uh, need a few minutes to get them together. I'm sorry. Can I, um, okay, let's go ahead into the public and we'll come back. Thank you. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak under oral communications? Yes. First up is Veronica Smoot, followed by Gail Rubino. Veronica, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes to address the City Council. Veronica, you should see a pop up on your screen requesting you to unmute. If you could please click the unmute button. Okay. Perfect. We can hear you now. Okay. My name is Veronica Smoot and I bought a new mobile home in Plaza del Rey in 2007. I'm a single wage earner, not high tech, in high tech. Plaza del Rey was the, at the time the lowest space rent and gave you free Comcast TV, which was taken away a few years later, but that doesn't matter. My space rent then was $750 a month plus utilities. My space rent is now 1225 plus utilities, but I have no complaints. It's only fair that the park raises the rent every year. I'm here to ask you to put a stop to the new buyer rent increase, which has devastated all of us. In 2016, Carlisle Group bought our park and without notice, decided to raise the rent for new buyers to 1600 a month, and by the time they sold us four years later, the rent was 2,200 a month. And now with hometown, it is 2,380 a month for a new buyer in our park. No one in our park can sell their house. The park owners say it is fair market value, but how can it be when the other three parks around us are still charging new tenants anywhere from 1150 to 1300 a month. And our park is charging 2380, which that's almost twice what the other parks are charging. We have had to lower our selling price from 80 to 120,000 or more, and they still do not sell. We had 44 homes for sale a couple months ago. I think it might be closer to 50 now. The other parks have six to eight homes for sale. One realtor told me a 2002 mobile home in our park is up for sale for 175. The same house in Casa is listed for 359 and the same house in Adobe Wells is listed for 333,000. Oh, is that right? It is price gouging to me. Same as you see in the news during hurricane and earthquake selling 24 packs of water for $50. That is against the law and so should this be. People in Plaza del Rey are being held hostage. We can't move our home. There's a lot of reason why some people need to move. Death, having to move to an assisted living place, job change, or simply like me, I'll be 70 next year. I will not be able to pay mortgage and space rent on my social security. 
Many people are underwater trying to sell in our park. And I, for one, do not want to have to owe on my mortgage once I sell. But many people are facing exactly that. And I'm afraid I will also. Worst decision I made was moving into this park. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Gail Rubino, followed by Rick. Gail, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes to address the city council. Hi, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor and city council people. Good afternoon or good evening actually. Um, actually, Veronica Smoot just stole my thunder. So I'll just reiterate what she said. The issue in the mobile home parks is a fact uh, and you guys all know it is economics. People only have so much to spend on housing. And let's say it's, you know, $4,000 a month. And the reason that the houses in comparable houses in Casa at 359 and Adobe at 333, the reason the same house sells for $150,000 in Plaza is because the difference in rent. If the rent is twice as much in Plaza, it means that the price of the house has to be less in order for the person to afford it. And this has been going obviously since Carlisle bought it and they, they disrupted the, the market. What we'd like to see is some way that we can like freeze the space rent in Plaza until we start negotiating on the, on the um, memorandum of understanding and that's sort of like a, a, a position of a good faith so that the people in Plaza can sell their homes. I'm going to yield the rest of my time because um, Ms. Smoot really covered my issue. So I'm going to yield my time. Thanks a lot. And you guys have a great evening. Thanks, Gail. Next up is Rick, followed by someone who called in with a Gmail or joined with a Gmail email address. Rick, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes to address the city council. Hello. Uh, thank you for giving us the time. Actually, Veronica and Gail uh, stole my fire. Also, uh, I am a homeowner in Plaza del Rey. Uh, I, we spoke October 13th in which uh, we were trying for the RSO, which now I see that Mayor Klein will be once again the mayor until the next election, which so I'm glad to have you on board because I know you voted for us to get the rent stabilization ordinance. Uh, we're looking for a moratorium on hometown America to not jack the space fee at the end of this year until we've handled our circumstances that are completely out of control. Uh, this 2380 for the new buyer, uh, it totals $28,560 a year. That is just coming in. That is with no 4% to 7% increase after the first 12 months which that is 29,000 just for the space fee, not including utilities, uh, your mortgage and your, uh, what's that? Yeah, utilities. Anyways, uh, I am simply just reiterating, I guess. Uh, we're frustrated here. There's old folks here who can't take care of themselves in a certain amount of time, they will have to leave and to lose because of, uh, I look at it like thieves, that they just stole people's lives over here. Uh, I just really hope that you guys uh, jump on board and help us out here. Uh, I am also gonna yield my time. Uh, thank you. Next up is someone who joined with email K-A-M-E, and it ends with Gmail, followed by Tanya Ivanov. Uh, the person who joined with an email address, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes to address the city council. It looks like you've un been unmuted.
I'm not Tanya. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Good evening, council members. I'm Fred Cometa, a resident of Plaza Del Rey, Mobile Home Park. Tonight, I wish to address what the failure of enacting legislation to put a moratorium on vacancy control has brought to more than a thousand families. Four years ago, our residents had about the same new buyer space rent as other parks in Sunnyvale. Then our park was bought out and the owners raised this new buyer space rent about $600 above every other park. We petitioned you to protect us by enacting legislation. Your response was, put, was to put the matter into a study. Finally, two years later, the Housing Commission had a survey done. This study or survey exhibited that 82% of mobile home residents did not meet the affordable housing criteria where housing, total housing costs should not exceed more than household income. Even with this glaring statistic, it took more than two years before you, the council, put this matter on your agenda. At your last meeting, you again refused to enact this legislation. Now your lack of actions have allowed park owners to raise new buyer space rents to such levels that our families are being forced into foreclosures and financial disaster. You all proudly talk about how Sunnyvale is making great strides to accommodate affordable housing, yet you ignore the plight of mobile home residents who are supposed to be in affordable housing. I have to face these distraught residents every day. Now I invite each of you city councilmen who council members who voted against the RSO to face them. Will you listen to their horrible situation and will you tell them why you voted no? I'm willing to organize a Zoom and invite each of you. So please, please listen to us. Thank you, I yield the rest of my time. Next up is Tanya Ivanov followed by Danielle Overstein. Tanya, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes to address the city council. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, members of the council. My name is Tanya Ivanov and I'm a resident of Plaza del Rey. I'm speaking on behalf of the Sunnyvale Alliance who represent the residents of mobile home parks in Sunnyvale. Tonight, we are asking for the council to support us in asking Hometown America to implement a voluntary moratorium on vacancy rents to provide protection during the development of the MOU. We are signaling out Hometown America because they are the outlier here. Presently, vacancy rents are double that of other parks with comparable amenities. Plaza del Rey's vacancy rent for new buyers is 2380 or 2540 as stated at the 1013 council meeting. We understand based on prior history that Hometown America is planning an additional increase over and above the 2380-2540 vacancy rent come January. We ask for your support and for Hometown America to seize with any more vacancy rent increases while we work together in good faith to correct this problem that was identified last month at the council meeting. At that meeting, this council heard from 20 residents and many other interested parties who expressed that their ability to sell their homes has been decimated as a result of these rates. You heard from residents, senior citizens who are living on fixed incomes and are losing retirement savings and having to choose between paying their housing costs versus medicine or food, and they cannot sell their homes. Studies have shown that for every $100 increase in rent, the value of a mobile home depreciates by 10,000. Home values have depreciated so much at Plaza del Rey that they're just sitting on the lots, unable to sell, creating immense financial hardship to its residents. Members of this council, you voted to begin the process and implement an MOU. This was your answer to the financial devastation that residents are currently undergoing. An MOU will take at least six months to accomplish and any further increases on vacancy rent at Plaza del Rey will dilute the goals of this council, which was to provide fairness and good faith during these negotiations. Furthermore, a rollback after six months of negotiations as suggested at the last council meeting to the 2380 rent when the MOU is completed does not solve our immediate and dire concerns. We reiterate today that we cannot sell our homes at the present rate. We cannot wait. 
until the MOU is complete. The rents are exorbitant and totally financially crippling the residents of Plaza del Rey, and it will six months from now. We are asking, please, that Hometown America agree to not raise the vacancy rents while we negotiate fair terms for residents of mobile homes and for this council's support. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Danielle Overstein. Danielle, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes to address the city council. Danielle, you should see a pop-up on your screen asking you to unmute. There we go. Hi there, sorry about that. Um, my name is Danielle Hoverston. Um, I, like many of the other speakers here, am a, a resident of Plaza del Rey. Um, my space rent is over $2,100 per month right now, not including my mortgage fees uh, that I pay each month. Um, I'm not on a fixed income, but many Plaza del Rey residents are. The enormous space rent increase uh, increases that we've seen over the last few years are driving residents out of Sunnyvale. Uh, we really need your help uh, with rent stabilization. This has been a really hard year for many, many people. Many people are being driven out of the park um, and space rents are continuing to be raised despite the fact that many people are not receiving cost of living increases. Um, we really just, we, we need the help of our elected officials to put some sort of rent stabilization in place um, to control hometown America's rampant increases that are, that are making people not be able to live in the area. Um, I go, I'll go ahead and yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, that was the final speaker under oral communications. Okay, thank you very much. Council member Goldman. Hi, I do have some announcements. Um, three, um, thank you for waiting for a minute. Uh, one is the first one is community workshops and city council study sessions for the Moffat Park specific plan. <laughs> the city of Sunnyvale would like to invite the public to the Moffat Park specific plans upcoming community workshops and city council study sessions. On November 30, November 30th, the cons consultant team and city staff will launch the first of three virtual community workshops. The workshops are designed to include two hours of community engagement immediately followed by a city council study session. The topics selected represent critical issues for the plan area. The first workshop will discuss sea level rise and climate change and is scheduled for November 30th at 4 p.m. Please visit the Moffat Park Specific Plan website at moffatparksp.com for more information on the workshop schedule and participation options and to sign up for emails to receive updates on future activities and updates on the Moffat Park Specific Plan. For questions or further clarification, please contact Michelle King, Principal Planner at mking at sunnyvale.ca.gov or 408-730-7463 or the Moffat Park Specific Plan Answer Point at Moffat Park at sunnyvale.ca.gov. That's the first one. Second one is about COVID testing. <laughs> city COVID testing sites. We, are in, we, the city, encourage you to do your part to stop the spread of COVID-19 and get tested regularly. You should get tested, especially if you were exposed to someone who tested positive, attended a large gathering, work in retail as a first responder or other frontline work. Testing, testing is convenient and free. There are 50 testing locations available across the county. Check the county website for new dates and pop-up locations at www.sccfreetest.org. That's the second one. Oh, free, I'm sorry, free testing at Murphy Park, 260 North Sunnyvale Avenue in Sunnyvale is happening on Monday, November 23rd, that's almost two weeks, 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. at free testing at Murphy Park, Monday, November 23rd, 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. 
the third and final one. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, city of the city of Sunnyvale is currently accepting applications for the community events grant and neighborhood grant programs for events or projects occurring January 1st to December 31st, 2021. The community events grant program provides grant funds to nonprofit or not-for-profit organizations planning to host a free and open to the public community event in Sunnyvale. <laughs> the neighborhood grant program provides grant funds to neighborhood groups for events or projects that help build community engagement, develop a sense of pride and ownership, and or improve the quality of life in their neighborhoods. Applications for both programs are due by November 20th, 2020 by 5 p.m. Applications can be dropped off in person at the Sunnyvale Community Center on 550 East Remington Drive or emailed to ncs at sunnyvale.ca.gov. To learn more about grant programs, visit sunnyvale.ca.gov. For more information, email ncs at sunnyvale.ca.gov or call 408-730-7599. Thank you, and that concludes the announcements. Thank you, Councilmember Goldwyn. Uh, next up is our consent calendar. Since we remain in a virtual setting, I will ask the public to use the virtual raise your hand feature or dial star nine on your telephone to indicate that they wish to speak on a consent calendar item. The city clerk will then ask you to unmute your microphone when it is your turn to address city council. City clerk, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on a consent calendar item? Yes, Mr. Mayor, we have four members of the public that have indicated a desire to speak. Um, we haven't had this happen too often during a Zoom session, so I recommend we just quickly check in with all four of them to see which item they're interested in speaking on, and then council will know which ones they'd like to pull. Sure. Go ahead. So for the four members of the public who've raised your hand, we're just going to first unmute you to check in to see which item you want to speak on. So, Jaime Rojas, which agenda item are you desiring to speak on tonight? Uh, Mr. City Clerk, uh, 1E, please. Thank you. George Johnson, uh, which item are you intending to speak on tonight? Same as Jaime Rojas, please. Thank you. And then uh, Rima, we actually, we spoke, so I know which item you're intending to speak on. Ahmed Kadir, which item are you intending to speak on tonight? Uh, the, the proposed uh, flavor ban, please. Thank you. And Sanjeev Patel, which item are you intending to speak on tonight? Uh, Fluid tobacco ban. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Rajav, which item are you intending to speak on tonight? Flavor ban. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Mayor, all six members of the public intend to speak on item 1E. Okay. Uh, so I will now ask for a motion from my colleagues and I'm assuming we'll be pulling one item 1E one and discussing it afterwards. Uh, Vice, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Smith. Yeah, I move items 1A through 1D, please. Council Member Melton. Second. Thank you. City Clerk, may we, may we please have a roll call vote? Yes, first up, Council Member Fong, how do you vote? Yes. Councilmember Goldman? Yes. Mayor Klein? Yes. Councilmember Hendricks? Yes. Councilmember Melton? Yes. Vice Mayor Smith? Yes. And Councilmember Larson? Yes. The motion carries 7 0. Thank you. And let's go ahead and handle 1E. Um, item 20-0945, adopt an ordinance number 3166-20 to amend Sunnyvale Municipal Code Chapter 9.28 to prohibit the sale of flavored tobacco products. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, open the public hearing. And I know that there are members of the public. So just for, for a reminder, uh, we'll, since we're remaining in a virtual setting, I'll remind, ask the public to use the virtual raise your hand feature or dial star nine on your telephone if they wish to speak on this item. 
The city clerk will then ask you to unmute your microphone when it's your turn to address the city council. City clerk, can we, can you please bring in the public who wish to speak on this item? Yes, first up is Jaime Rojas, followed by George Johnson. Jaime, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes to address the city council. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. I spoke at the last, at the first reading of this ordinance and I completely agree with council member Fong on a step-by-step -step basis on uh, redoing this ordinance. We've given the facts that the retailers are not the issue here with a 95 compliance success rate in the past five years. As we noted, most of these sales are done online. Um, and I'm sure most of the council members have visited most of the retail stores in the city of Sun Sunnyvale and realized that the footprint of where these products are sold are by law, federal, state, and local behind the counter and in a very small confined area, not accessible to youth, unlike alcohol, which is next to water in a, refrigera in a refrigerated door. Um, and we're looking at the steps that Council Member Fong uh, also suggested. Let's look at education and uh, code enforcement. Much of the tobacco dollars that are being used by the state and the county are not being used in the city of Sunnyvale. Millions of dollars of sales tax, tobacco sales tax dollars are being used in other parts of the county and other state and not rightfully used for code enforcement or education. In the, um, in the school district, only about two to three hours of edu tobacco education is being done to high school students and less than one hour to middle school. Um, we're asking that the school, that the uh, city council work with the school district this, and the superintendent to work on getting dollars, rightfully so from Sunnyvale um, sale, tobacco sales and force the health department of, uh, of the county to bring in revenues to enforce code enforcement and education. Just like the numbers are extremely low in the past 20 years for combustible cigarettes, education and code enforcement are the number one uh, derailers of youth access. We'll use recent um, statistics. Uh, two years ago when the city of San Francisco passed their flavor ban, the numbers of youth usage has not dropped down. Santa Clara County also, one of the first ones about five years ago, their usage of vaping, which is the number one issue, has not dropped either because the issue comes from online sales and not local tobacco retailers who follow the rules and regulations because they're part of the community and the last line of defense in protecting and checking IDs to the youth community. We ask you to reconsider this, not look at what um, a lot, the community, uh, excuse me, not look at what the health department is looking for a grade versus the reality of small business who works with the community, who works with the city council, who works with the school district and reconsider this. We thank you. Mr. Mayor, I had a request from uh, Rima and George. Rima is going to start a presentation, and then if she needs additional time, George is going to complete it. Okay. So with that, Rima, you're going to be up next, and okay. I will let you know when you have 30 seconds remaining. Let me get your okay. presentation shared. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right. Well, good evening. My name is Rima Corey. I'm general counsel for Pumari, a premium hookah tobacco company. I'm also a founding member of the hookah, National Hookah Community Association. Next. Hookah. Wait, next. <laughs> hookah is a water pipe used to smoke flavored tobacco with a hose. It's a cultural tradition practiced by Arabs, Persians, Armenians, Turks, and Indians for over five centuries. Next. Next, hookah is a social custom often seen in hookah, tobacco, hookah cafes in the Middle East. Hookah is not the problem amongst teens. According to this 2019 CDC survey, hookah use among high school students is 3.4%. You don't see hookahs getting confiscated in schools or kids smoking hookah in the school bathroom at recess. Yet hookah has become collateral damage in the flavored tobacco bans sweeping across the states. Next. According to an April 2020 FDA industry guidance, although data shows that flavored tobacco entice youth, that such data does not appear to raise comparably urgent 
public health concerns with youth usage of hookah products because of its low youth prevalence. Next. Governor Gavin Newsom stated in a 2000, uh, September 2019 executive order that hookah is not the problem in classrooms. Next. Hookahs are normally three feet tall and cannot be easily concealed in a backpack or pocket. Next. Hookah tobacco cannot be rolled into a joint or blunt or smoked in a bong, vaped or chewed. Next. Hookahs generally take 15 to 30 minutes to set up. Next. In addition, hookahs are not something you do on the go or throughout the day. Next. According to a 2018 FDA study, 90% of Americans who use hookah do so no more than once per month. Hookahs are a uniquely social and cultural activity that is done occasionally. Next, SBA, SB793 is a statewide flavor ban that was passed in August this year. The video. Thank you. Okay, well, Senator Hill learned the difference between hookah and vape and understood the cultural significance of hookah. I can see that it's not playing. I'm sorry, I don't want to. <laughs> uh, uh, my good friend from Los Angeles raised the hookah. Goals without hookah with, oh, with, uh, with hookah uh, exemption in this legislation is based on the fact that when you look at a hookah, and I learned a lot in this, I was not familiar with how that applied, but all hookah, tobacco, sisha, is flavored. It is historically, that is how it is. It is a flavored tobacco product. And as you know, it is consumed through a pipe that's not concealable. It's not something you can walk down the street with. It's not something you can plug into the USB drive on your computer. It is a very large device. And it is also the use of a hookah is used for celebra uh, celebratory events on special occasions. It's not a daily used product. And that's why it's different than an e-cigarette. It's different than a tobacco cigarette. And it's different than a vaping device. And that's why we felt that it would be appropriate to exclude them because it's not the same problem as we find today. So if I could continue, Madam President, you know, big tobacco has put a price on our kids' lives, but I refuse to do so. SB 793 Stop. will be a public health victory in- Stop. Okay, next. So uh, there is that a way to achieve regulatory goals Ma without Ms. giving Rima, or Rima, that your three minutes can expired I, can during I just that video. Say one last thing. Uh, just a sentence or two, yes. Oh, okay, just we just ask that you please exempt hookah and use the language from SB seven nine three to preserve our right to practice our cultural tradition. Thank you. Next up is George Johnson, file followed by Ahmed Kadir. George, you've been unmuted. Please let me know if you wanted to continue additional slides in that presentation. Um, sure, that can be played while I speak. Okay. So good evening, city council. My name is George Johnson. I'm a manufacturer of traditional wooden hookah pipes and I have many customers in the Bay Area. Most of my customers hail from the Middle East. Many come from Persian, Indian, Turk, Arab descent. And I find it very disheartening that they are losing their businesses right now for something that they didn't cause, a problem that's not related to them. And so I'm just hoping that you guys can take into consideration that hookah, is not something that you can find. You couldn't hide a hookah in your own home from your parents. You know, this is not 
our youth use rate, rates are so low. My pipes start at $250 and go up to $2,500 per piece. It's something that's not affordable. It's not compulsive. It's something that is used occasionally in, in, in social atmospheres. And in, in, in this day and age, I mean, we have such a tough economic crisis hitting this country to shut people out of legally operating businesses that are federally legal it, it, it's it's just adding insult to injury. And I, I side with, you know, chambers of commerce and people who want to work with legislators to make sure that minors are not getting their hands on youth products. Where is it more likely? Children can go online, click that they're 21 and up, use a debit card or a gift card to try to get products shipped to them. Or will they have to go into a store where they have to show their face and show an ID? you know, that's, it's, it's simple. And I believe that we can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We need to focus legislation in on what is the problem at hand. So I please urge you to follow the language of SB 793, or to please revisit this and think of a way that we can have our cake and eat it too. Thank you for your time. Next up is Ahmed Kadir, followed by Sanjeev Patel. Ahmed, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes to address the city council. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to talk about the flavor ban. Uh, I have moved to Sunnyvale uh, 18 years ago. I'm a citizen. I'm originally from Egypt, where hookah is uh, my culture. Uh, my problem with the flavor ban is that I smoke at home in my balcony. I buy my tobacco locally, which we call shisha. Now, when you ban my tobacco, I will have to drive another 15, 20 minutes to go and buy my tobacco from another city. I'll probably have to order it online and have it mailed to my home. You're not fixing the problem. The problem is with parents like me who cannot tell their kids not to smoke vape with store owners who do not enforce the law and sell to minors. That's where the problem is. Stop selling tobacco and vape to children. That's your problem. Don't cancel our culture. Are you going to ban flavored alcohol as well? Vodka? How many DUIs do we have every year in Sunnyvale? Stop those problems. Save those lives. Don't touch our culture. It's becoming racist. This is too much. Thank you. Next up is Sanjeev Patel followed by Mo. Sanjeev, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes to address the city council. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak. Uh, this is Sanjeev Patel from APCA, American Petroleum and Convenience Store Association. We are representing about 1,500 uh, gasoline service stations and uh, uh, convenience store operator uh, statewide. Uh, we have members in Sunnyvale and throughout the Bay Area, and these are all responsible business owners. Uh, as an industry, we check double the identifications every single day than the TSA does, and our track record is 99 plus higher. So most of the teenagers are getting their hands on the tobacco is not through the convenience store channel, but through the other channels like online or through their adult friends or the family members. And we are getting punished every single time, uh, painted as a, as a bad actor who is putting profit above the life of the teenagers, but that is not really the case. Uh, COVID-19 has already uh, affected our businesses extremely heavily. A lot of uh, businesses are hanging by the thread and this additional burden will pretty much uh, put them to death. Uh, and the last point I'd like to make, I'm sure we have all discussed about this, but the, under SB 793, state has already passed the bill so that this flavored tobacco will have a statewide ban. So why for the two months, city wants to go, this, go through this bureaucracy and increase and pass this uh, ordinance 
which is going to be superseded by the State Assembly Bill 793 anyway. So I'd re request that let's just wait out for two, three months and see how the state ban works out. And if it's uh, not uh, restrictive enough for the city, then you can always revisit and add something to it. But the way uh, that I know about the SB 793, it's a lot more restrictive than what the Sunnyvale is proposing. So I highly recommend that we not go through and add additional bureaucracy and implementation efforts into this uh, city uh, bill and wait for the state bill to see how it pans out. Thank you. Next up is Mo, followed by Sam. Mo, you've been unmuted and you have three Hello. minutes to address the city council. Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Uh, we we own a smoke shop on Murphy Street. And uh, I would like to talk about the, the flavor ban and how I don't like it personally because we small we small business owners. And uh, I think banning the flavored tobacco is, is not a good idea right now since the state is already talking about banning it all over the state. And uh, I think it's going to hurt the city more by, you know, because we pay a lot of taxes, small businesses, and, you know, most of it goes to the city and the federal. So I think the city is losing on that one. And uh, another thing is we was closed for like three to four months by the COVID and uh, we owe the landlords a lot of money. Like uh, our shop owes like $28,000 right now to the landlord and we're behind. So I hope you guys reconsider like net banning in the city and until the state actually bans it. That way it gives us time to get rid of our inventory, which we have over $100,000 worth of inventory. And, um, and I think the ban is going to, is going to happen at least, if, if the ban is going to happen, at least let the smoke shops sell tobacco flavors because to be in the smoke shop, you have to be 21 or older and you have to show ID just like any other boy. And uh, if we actually look up the numbers of teens smoking and drinking, it's almost the same numbers. And smoking is actually, you know, it doesn't put you as the same danger as uh, drinking alcohol. So I don't know why is everybody focused on the flavored tobacco when it actually helps a lot of people, especially the vape system. It helps a lot of people quit smoking cigarettes, which, which I'm one of them. I used to smoke cigarettes and I play sports too. So when I used to smoke cigarettes and I play, I run out of breath in like 10 minutes. But ever since I started, I started vaping, you know, I feel healthier. I feel better about myself, like even when I run and stuff. So I think you guys should reconsider it and uh, don't do the small businesses like that, please, because it really hurts us, especially if it comes from the city that we've been paying a lot of taxes to. Thank you. Next up is Sam, followed by Anchal Takiar. Sam, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes to address the city council. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor. Good evening, Councilman and woman. Uh, my name is Sam. Uh, I'm an owner of a business in uh, Sunnyville. And uh, my concern is uh, that you guys are banning the flavors right now. Well, the state of California is about to ban it in two months. If you guys could push it back a little bit or reconsider it, where that flavor ban is going to happen anyways within two months. There's nothing that we or you guys could stop it. So with that being said, it's not going to affect it with doing it for two months ahead of time. You know, it's going to happen regardless. So if you guys could reconsider it until the state bans it anyways, that will be great. It will help us majorly. And another thing is about the flavor hookah. You're not going to see a teenager walking on the street with a hookah that's four foot long with a pipe that's six foot long i could understand you guys banned the, the vaping because it's easy to carry it's chargeable anywhere you can hook it up to a usb and charge it but the hookah flavors i don't see where that's going to help any teenagers anything i don't see any teenagers smoking them to begin with everybody that smokes a, a hookah you're going to see it's over 30 and 
he's not going to be carrying it anywhere with him. It's always at home. Even at home, you can't really hide it. It's that big. So I would really appreciate if you guys consider it and look through it. Thank you so much. Next up is Anshal Takiar, followed by Shivani. On Chaltikyar, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes to address the city council. Hello, city council. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, thanks for hearing me out. Um, I just wanted to point out um, that if we pass this law, again, it will lead to store sales going down and um, basically affecting every business not just big big businesses, uh, even small businesses, even these small businesses um, are a big impact to every community. So we have to understand that each and every business really matters in every community. That's how an economy builds up. That's like a basic knowledge. Um, but I would like to say that even this might feel like a small thing, but um, as sales go down, um, there will be less and less money made for each businesses. And if these each businesses, um, this goes down, um, that will eventually affect their workers. If there's not enough profit, how are the workers going to be paid? I know, again, this seems like a small, tiny bit thing, but obviously it's going to affect um, everybody. So please, please reconsider this decision um, and it's really, I feel not needed right now. We already have COVID hitting every business really hard and we currently do not need this um, on our head. So um, yeah, please reconsider this. Thank you. Next up is Shivani. Shivani, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes to address the city council. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we, we can. can. Uh, so the, I want to consider about this, the sale um, ban of tobacco sale. Uh, so um, already the COVID is hitting us, uh, like uh, affecting our businesses and everything. And my whole family is in a business. And if we do the ban on a tobacco sale, it's going to affect our like whole family survival. And basically it's going to affect the sales of the stores and everything on it. So please consider on this it's got really going to affect like small businesses or big businesses like the people going to find any other way like online sales or online businesses anywhere but the stores are the basic one who going to get affected more from here so please consider on the tobacco ban thank you Mr. Mayor, that was the final speaker on this agenda item. Okay. I will close the public hearing. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. we just had a member of the, sorry, one hand just popped right up. I will not close the public hearing. Go ahead. Okay, now another hand. So we have uh, Raghav, followed by a call-in person whose phone number ends in 476. Raghav, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes to address the city council. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, good evening, city councils. Uh, so I was looking into this law, uh, this new bill. So I guess this, I'm a store owner of this local 7-Eleven, basically in the neighborhood. And looking into this law is really going to affect pretty badly at our stores, it's not just my store, but all the local businesses. To be honest, we get about like 15 to 20% of our sales and we are going to lose all these sales. And eventually what it's gonna affect on my business pretty badly. I have already survived in the COVID through PPP loan and EDIL loan. And now if this thing comes into effect, I probably have to end up losing my employees because there is not enough profits even to be made to hardly survive. And I don't get the point. Why are we trying to push this right before when this 
there is a California is trying to pass this law. So I think we should reconsider it and wait till what the California decide and go with right along with them because within these two months, we are going to lose all our customers and they're probably going to walk out and probably start going to sh shop online and, you know, just make those big companies even more bigger. And why are we not considering this local stores who are paying taxes and all these taxes are coming to the city. And on the another part, if we have this kind of problem, what I have been noticing, like, you know, like we have some parents, grandparents who might just end up buying uh, those flavored tobacco and just handing it over to their kids in their home or something. So I believe we should probably, instead of doing that, enforce the other way and tell them like, hey, you know, like run a sting operation or something where a overage person is buying a tobacco and try if see if there is an underage person is buying outside the store or something. That's what would be my conclusion is. So hopefully you guys consider this again because if if it passed, it's just gonna make my things even more bad for our store. So thanks for that. Thank you. And you have one question, uh, Councilmember Melton. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Mayor Klein. Rehav, hi, this is Russ Melton from Sunnyvale City Council. You said you were um, an owner or franchisee or proprietor of one of our 7-Elevens. Did I hear that right? Yes. Hey, which 7-Eleven is it? Is it uh, Fremont over by um, Wolf Road? Uh, it's by Old San Francisco. Okay. That helps clarify. And then you stated a percentage of your total sales in, in your store that came from all tobacco, or were you saying uh, flavored tobacco? Can you just help me understand? It's overall tobacco sales. Okay. And what, what percentage number was that? Uh, we do about like 15%. Okay. And so there's a difference between non-flavored tobacco and flavored tobacco. Do you know roughly what the split is in your store between regular non-flavored tobacco and uh, flavored tobacco? Is it 50-50 maybe? Yeah, it's around 50-50. Okay, hey, that's really helpful. I appreciate it, thank you. Sure, thanks. Next up is a member of the public who called in with a phone number that ends in 476. Um, you've been unmuted, and you have three minutes to address the city council. Hello, Mayor and Council Members. This is Mary Kemp. I am the Northern California Grassroots Manager for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. Um, you are probably familiar. Our mission is to end suffering and death from cancer, and we're committed to doing that work in Sunnyvale. Um, I wanted to first address some of the miscommunication I heard in previous testimony. Um, the State Bill 793 has been challenged in the referendum process, and so it is not a certainty that this bill will go into law. And so it has perhaps never been more important for local councils to take action. Um, we know that uh, local policies can be made even stronger than what we have at the state level, and we think that we can protect more youth by taking this route. Um, additionally, uh, I think it's important to note that young people who smoke menthol cigarettes and uh, tend to be disproportionately African Americans, Asian Americans, LGBTQA members, and from low-income communities, they are often uh, living in the community the communities where tobacco stores are loca located in higher density. And so I think this sort of coupled with the public health crisis that we are seeing has made it a very critical time to ensure that we are protecting the lung health of young individuals in our communities um, who may be more compromised um, if they are uh, exposed to COVID-19. We, we certainly want to do what is best uh, to protect the young individuals in our communities. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.
Thank you. And you have one question from Council Member Goldman. Hi, um, thank you for your uh, comments. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, there's a couple of issues here. The issue that the majority of the uh, speakers were, were addressing and that was about the hookah. Uh, now I've, I've looked it up and it's, it's uh, worse than cigarettes in some cases, but it is, their argument is that typically, not always, but typically it's uh, large enough that it's hard to conceal. So youth, they, they argue, would not be likely to take it. Now we're not, if we were debating, uh, ta talking about banning, uh, banning tobacco entirely, that would be one issue, but we're only talking about banning flavored tobacco. Um, and they're asking uh, for an exception to that. How do you feel about that? Um, well, I think that what we know is that, you know, as we make exemptions, it creates more loopholes and ways for youth to find tobacco. And for those youth that are already addicted, and there are large numbers of youth in our communities already addicted, um, there are no youth uh, FDA approved cessation devices. So once these young people are addicted to the products, they they will seek other ways to try to um, to get their nicotine fixed, uh, to get their uh, their needs met. And so every exemption that we carve out is is one more loophole and one more way um, that youth can make that shift or that transition. We know that flavors make it a, a little bit easier on the throat, uh, more appealing, it smells better. Um, and, and so, you know, while it might not be the thing that all youth are using in this moment right now, it doesn't mean uh, that it's not something that they would pivot to. So I, I, th I think that the stronger uh, bill is to, you know, not have any exemptions okay. for any type uh, the, of flavored product. And the other issue raised was a, um, Cultural, uh, cultural heritage thing uh, about um, being used in a communal uh, uh, setting. Uh, how uh, now, as you I'm sure know, we used to have everyone smoked all the restaurants, was in all the movies, and now mm -hmm. that's going away. But how do you? Uh, they are are arguing that this is a cultural tradition, and they feel it's against their culture to give it up. How do you feel about that? Yeah, and I mean, I, I'm not sure if I'm qualified to speak on that as, as much because it's not something that I have personally put as much research into. But what I can tell you is that um, there are a number, a number of young ambassadors that I work with out throughout the, the state of California um, that are a part of this culture. And these young individuals are very supportive of making this shift with in their culture. And so what I see is that that there is a push within the community to become more health minded uh, from the younger generation. Uh, that's that's really good to know. Um, our own culture has changed. Uh, the uh, Western culture has changed on smoking, too. So, uh, you know, perhaps mm -hmm. some other time you could bring one of those representatives of, of another culture. Thank you. That's my question. And my questions. You're Thank welcome. You. Mr. Mayor, that's the final speaker. Um, Ahmed Kadir did raise their hand again. However, they already spoke. On that. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I will close the public hearing. And if there are any questions of staff first, and I did have a question. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Nagel, uh, just as just as a clarification, as far as this, this is the second reading of the ordinance. And as I remember from the ordinance itself, it was uh, going to go into effect six months uh, after the ordinance takes effect, correct? Is that true? Or whoever on staff can answer that? Hi, this is Christy Gumbelson. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. So, so thank you, Christy. Um, and from, so from uh, assuming that there is a motion to, to approve the second reading of the ordinance today, um, that, that means that on, I guess it's, it's six months from now, um, April, no, May, uh, 10th, it would then go into effect. And so that, and that was one of the reasons I think we, when we talked about this last, um, uh, that 
the store owners would have a, an extended period of time to deal with their inventory. Is that correct? Yes, and um, it would be June 2021. June. Thank you. Okay, so it's not six months from today. It's it's six months after the second reading. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's Thirty six, days. It's it's after six the months second. After, it's yeah. It's six months after it becomes effective, which is thirty days after the second reading. So it's seven months from today. June. Thank you. Okay, that, I appreciate that. Uh, Councilmember Melton. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Klein. Um, I'm sorry if I missed it in the dialogue, but with regards to SB 793, and then there's a veto referendum being put forth that if it gather, gathers enough signatures that the SB 793 would be postponed or delayed. Do we have a track on how the signature gathering process is going or is the referendum likely to be placed on the ballot? Um, we do have a track on that. Um, as far as um, probably last week, uh, they were required to have, I think, uh, 600,000 signatures and they have over 3 million. So we do expect that to um, uh, go through, which would then um, uh, make it a, a ballot initiative for November 2022. So it would not be able to go into effect as planned if that's the case. Got it. Thank you, Christy. And then um, just for clarification, the ordinance that we're talking about right now um, bans the sale of flavored tobacco. It does not ban the sale of non-flavored tobacco and it does not ban the sale of um, hookah devices. Did I get all that correct, Christy? You got that all correct. It's just flavors. And because it's so important, uh, I'll also mention that included in flavored tobacco is menthol. Is that a correct statement? That is correct. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Christy. Thank you. Uh, next up is Council Member Goldman. Thank you, Mayor Klein. Uh, so do we have any insights into what other cities that have passed flavored tobacco bans have done to address the uh, people from the hookah uh, retailer or using community? So all the um, municipalities in Santa Clara County that have banned flavored tobacco have not exempted hookah. And um, it's about half of the um, municipalities in the county have banned flavors. No exemption. Okay, now and there's nothing, or there's nothing that would prevent someone from taking unflavored tobacco and adding some molasses uh, or some other flavoring to that. I, I mentioned molasses because in the Wikipedia article, they mentioned that as something typically added in Middle Eastern and Indian areas. Yeah, people can add it. They just can't buy it. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Melton. Yeah, Mayor Klein, I'm ready with a motion when you are. Go right ahead. Okay, so I'm going to move staff recommendation, adopt ordinance number 3166-20 to amend Sunnyvale Municipal Code Chapter 9.28 to prohibit the sale of flavored tobacco products. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Hendricks. I'll second that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Hendricks for the second. I've just been sorting out a, a bunch of things here in my mind as we um, go through this important process stipulated in the Sunnyvale City Charter um, of doing a second reading of the ordinance. And that allows us opportunities to do exactly what we're doing right now, which is to hear from folks uh, who want to uh, say whatever they feel they need to say with regards to new legislation coming to the Sunnyvale Municipal Code. So the process is working as intended and having thought through all of the arguments, um, I have a couple of things that I wanna say. First and foremost, um, I have the utmost respect for California State Senator Jerry Hill, one of our members of the public, played a video of him speaking. Um, with regards to the merits of the California legislation and an exemption for hookah. And um, uh, I completely understand where he's coming from and I give a lot of weight to um, uh, what he's talking about. 
uh, but I still come to the conclusion that um, what Sunnyvale is doing is the right thing and factors that go into that is that the um, ballot initiative has gained more than enough signatures. So the California legislation is gonna get delayed in its implementation. Um, so that's a big factor for me. And what we're talking about in Sunnyvale is a ban of flavored tobacco products, not a ban of the sale of non-flavored tobacco products. Uh, and we're not talking about banning any machinery such as hookah or vaping equipment or anything like that. This has always been a discussion of flavored tobacco product uh, banning, which includes menthol. And I'll just mention in the preamble to the Sunnyvale ordinance, a couple of things that we're trying to do here is that tobacco use remains the number one most preventable cause of death and disease in the United States. And also evidence and studies show that youth believe flavored tobacco products are safer and less addictive than non-flavored varieties. And so for the discussion that's happened so far today, um, with regards to youth, that this ordinance is not only about youth, it's about uh, the entire Sunnyvale population, both adult and minors. Um, and uh, finally, I wanted to say um, that uh, in my family, my wife is from the country of Algeria, which is on the north coast of Africa, on the southern edge of the Mediterranean. And in between the countries of Algeria and Egypt, you have Libya and Tunisia. Uh, and all four of those countries that I just mentioned, um, this is an important part of the culture and I feel pretty dialed into all of that by virtue of my family circumstances and um, am able to come to the conclusion that I've just stated. I hope that my colleagues support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Goldman. Thank you, Mayor Klein. I, I second everything that Council Member Melton said. Um, I want to address the hookah issue. I've uh, looked, educated myself somewhat on, on this. Uh, it is um, a way of concentrating. Uh, it is uh, the Wikipedia article is a um, good starting point. And you find that in fact, uh, hookahs, uh, using hookahs is much worse than using cigarettes for several reasons. And I've traced down, I traced down the um, scientific articles cited and read them thoroughly. So uh, this is not just flavored tobacco and it's not just youth. Uh, youth become non-youth, they become uh, adults and we want them to not smoke when they're adults and we want them to stop that, uh, that we want to stop, make that happen by stopping when they're young because once they're addicted, it's really, really, really hard. I, uh, cultures change and uh, smoking is going to, using like basically killing yourself with nicotine and carbon monoxide is going to uh, eventually leave all cultures. So if you're in the business of selling this, you really should look at other ways of making money. I'm sorry uh, that uh, this is um, even legal now. We're not banning tobacco, but we are trying to eventually, in the long term, get rid of the, its use, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Vice Mayor Smith. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, upon consideration, have reservations about the scope of this ordinance and will be voting against it. I would prefer to see an ordinance that has the same exemptions as the proposed law that is um, probably going to be up for veto, but I do feel that it is a bit more sensitive um, to cultural norms um, in support of hookah and has, in my opinion, um, is new uh, and should be taken into consideration um, relating to what the state um, legislators have thought, of, the thought they put into it. So I, I support the concept of a, of a tobacco ban. I think our proposal is a bit stricter than I would like to see. So I will be uh, voting against this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll be supporting this motion. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Melton and Hendricks for sponsoring the initial study. I do think that, you know, however we can uh, reduce the, the, the um, propensity to use, especially flavored tobaccos is, is 
one of the one of the best things we can do from a city standpoint. Uh, what we're doing here is putting a an ordinance in place and giving the retailer some time to to deal with their current inventories. I think that is fair. Um, and we're not outlawing hookah. We're basically outlawing the sale of tobacco. So for those that, from a cultural standpoint, wish to use it, they still have that capability. They just have um, to find their flavored tobacco somewhere else, or or use standard tobacco in their hookah. So so from that standpoint, you know, I think it is fair. I understand what's what's being done, um, but I do think uh, what we're doing is good for the health of our residents. So with that. Uh, City Clerk, may we please have a voice vote? Yes. First up, Vice Mayor Smith, how do you vote? No. Council Member Melton? Yes. Council Member Fong? No. Council Member Goldman? Yes. Council Member Larson? Yes. Mayor Klein? Yes. And Council Member Hendricks? Yes. The motion carries 5-2 with Vice Mayor Smith and Council Member Fong voting no. Okay, um, let's move on to our general business. First up is item 20-0049, request for continuance to a date uncertain for a proposed project general plan amendment initiation request to consider amending general plan designation for commercial to low density residential for the northwest portion of a site at 1689 South Wolf Road. Is there a staff report? Yes, Mayor, this is Trudy Ryan, Community Development Director. Just very briefly, the applicant has requested an, um, a continuance to a date uncertain so that they may explore other options and staff um, supports that and uh, recommends that the council continue this indefinitely to a date uncertain. Thank you. Okay, and do we have the applicant here tonight? Just to the question. I I don't I don't know. Okay. I don't think so. Okay. So we will move on. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor, we do have someone uh, who just raised their hand. So perhaps okay. they're the applicant. Up, oh, they lowered their hand. Never mind. Okay. Anyway, well, let's let's give them a chance. Uh, so let's open the public hearing. Um, since we remain in a virtual setting, I will ask the public to use a virtual raise your hand button or dial star nine on the telephone to indicate that they wish to speak. The city clerk will then ask to unmute your microphone when it's your turn to address city council. Um, if you are the applicant, you have a little more time. But with that, city clerk, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay, all that was for nothing. I will close the public hearing. Um, and do we need a motion um, to continue? To a date uncertain? Uh, yes. Okay, just to confirm. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Hendricks. Are you ready for a motion? Yes, I am. Yeah, I move uh, that we move this item to a city council meeting of a date uncertain. Thank you. Uh, council Member Melton. Second. And I don't think we need any discussion. Uh, City Clerk, may we please have a voice vote? Council Member Larson, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Fong? Yes. Sorry, can you say that again? Was that? Yes. Yes, thank you, sorry. Council Member Hendricks? Yes. Mayor Klein? Yes. Council Member Melton? Yes. Vice Mayor Smith? Yes. And Council Member Goldman. Yes. The motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Uh, next up is item 20-0943, continued from October 27th, 2020 council meeting. Receive and file the fiscal year 2020-2021 first quarter budget update and approve and approval of budget modification number eight in the amount of $1,932,000 to the Appropriate CARES Act funding. Is there a staff report? Yes, good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council, Tim Kirby, uh, Director of Finance. I'm gonna go over a, a PowerPoint. I'll move fairly quickly um, as this was continued a couple times. Um, it just goes over the report. We'll be doing quarterly updates throughout um, the year, um, as well as probably some fiscal updates and some economic updates during the strategic session and possibly also the uh, 
um, budget study issues workshop. So uh, thank you, David. Um, if you can go to the next slide. So this is the first quarter update. Um, if you can, yep, thank you. Um, this is going to cover uh, essentially what's what I'm going to focus on a little bit is 1920 data where we ended the year. Um, we are still uh, closing the year. We have um, completed the majority of the adjustments, um, with the exception of any any that come out of the independent audit. Those are generally not corrections, but reclassifications, for example. Um, and then we're going to be coming uh, with the year-end report in December and uh, bringing the CAFR to council as well. Um, next slide, please, David. So first quarter uh, budget update. <laughs> we are very early in the year. Um, it is tough, especially on the revenue side, to uh, really give a real clear view of what's going on this early in the year. Um, let me give you an example. Transient occupancy tax for um, September is not due until the end of October. So we don't have good numbers on what we've had through September until November, if that makes sense. So as things develop throughout the year, um, it gives us additional context and we really start to understand where we are. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll go through the general fund uh, revenues and then expenditures. Next slide, yep, thank you. Um, so again, I wanna caution council that these are preliminary numbers um, that we're still adjusting. Uh, these are the numbers from the report. I didn't wanna change them. They have already changed slightly, but not significantly. Um, so when you exclude the, this is the revenue chart, when you exclude the sale of property, um, which is uh, um, related to the Charles Street property and the housing project, so that didn't get done last year. We were about 3.7 million to the good over what we projected in the recommended budget for 1920. So um, overall under by 5.3 million, but you can really, you know, that sale of property is something that shifts year to year and, um, and, and will come to fruition when the actual transaction is closed. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, talking about where we're at, um, just overall, you can see here uh, the, the green bars are 2019, the um, gray bars are 2020, orange bars are 2021. So you can see the actuals by month here um, for July and August. So I didn't up that, update this slide quite yet to include um, the more recent months, but you will get a much fuller picture with the second quarter update. Um, but you can see here that um, we did a little bit better than uh, uh, prior year in both months. Um, so that's a positive sign. Next slide. Transient occupancy tax. So there are a couple of revenues that are really affected by COVID. We've talked about this before, we talked about it during the budget workshop. There's primary ones are sales tax and then transient occupancy tax. We are starting to see um, trends move up and I tried to, I'm sorry, I, I tried to correct the labels on this, but it, it didn't, uh, I didn't expand the boxes enough apparently. So you've got um, the average rate is the left axis. That's the average room rate. And then the right is the average uh, occupancy rate. Okay, are the lines or the, uh, and the lines are the average occupancy rate. So you can see we were, uh, and to give you some context of where we were, um, 18, 19, of course, we were very high. What we want to do is say what's happened in, since quarter four of 1920 versus the current quarter we're in, and we are starting to trend up. So that's a good sign. Um, our economy hotels are doing a little bit better than our, our premium hotels. You can see going back to 18, 19, that was different. Um, that is driven by room rate, a lot of it. And then also by the type of business that economy hotels with regular business travelers, um, you know, really uh, uh, rely on. Next slide. Sales tax, this is a little interesting. So um, in, you know, it's trending down and, and it's, we're on target to hit our, our um, 2021 um, estimate, which was about a little bit over 25 million. But what is very interesting to me about sales tax is the shift in the character of sales tax. So you see here, in fiscal year 9-10, I'm going to go back 10 years to give you the real overall trend. 
if you look specifically at like at business and industry versus the state and county pool, state and county pool reminder is internet sales. Okay, um, you can see a 910 and then to 1920 that's that dark blue and that sort of uh, what is that taupe? I'm not I'm not real good with my colors, but <laughs> um, you know you can see those pie slices shift. Um, and you can see the other ones sort of stay relatively the same. General consumer goods down a little bit, um, also in the, in 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 the overall sense. So that's what we're experiencing with sales tax right now: is that shift away from brick and mortar and away from business and industry and into the pool. Next slide. So property tax continues to be our friend assessed values continue to grow. Um, we experienced about 2% higher growth for the current year than we had originally planned in the adopted. So that's a positive sign. Um, we are seeing slowing roll growth for 21, 22. We're at around 3% right now. To give you an idea, 21, the current year is over 10%, just north of 10%. So um, definitely sales and, and role growth are slowing, but we'll continue to watch that as the role develops throughout the year. And then of course, appeals are up. So out of our top 10 taxpayers, seven have open appeals. Um, you know, this mainly happens with commercial businesses where they've recently sold, um, economy is slowed, they're gonna file an appeal, um, but it, they are, uh, we are seeing more appeals and, and we'll watch that closely. That was something that we saw in, with the Great Recession, there was a, a spike in appeals. The county assessor got backlogged and it took quite a while for that all to play out. Next slide. Utility users tax is a stable revenue that's been continuing to climb. You've got the top bar is electricity, um, gas is the bottom bar, and then telecom is the middle bar. I always point to the modernization which stabilized telecom. Um, that the voters adopted in 2016. Um, I would say a good chunk of the of the top bar for electricity is related to electricity rates. Um, I think definitely as you know, we see redevelopment, buildings are becoming more energy efficient, consumption is going down. So there's the two moving parts of rates versus consumption here. Next slide. Some of the um, uh, fees that are a little bit of a smaller percentage of the of the general fund, of course, recreation fees, um, you know, they're down because we're not providing, we're not able to provide the recreation services that we uh, typically would provide. Um, uh, just as a reminder, um, recreation services are not 100% cost recovery, but there is some cost recovery there. Um, and not all of the costs are fixed. There are um, you know, when you don't have a recreation class, you don't need to hold, uh, you know, uh, hire a recreation instructor. So uh, not all of the costs are fixed, but there are fixed costs there. And we're watching how those, how that plays out versus revenues. Uh, public safety fees, this is your uh, permit fees and things like that. Um, doing doing um, uh, better this year. And a lot of that's uh, based on where the staff is in terms of where they're doing permitting, where they're working and billing. And then community de development fees, this is in the general fund, so this is not um, permit fees. This is things like construction tax, um, did a little bit better um, and are at a better point uh, this year than they were last year. But again, those fees are very lumpy. It depends on when the actual um, permits and so forth are paid because they are tied to that activity. So even though this is general fund. Next slide, please. So on the expenditure side, um, you know, I want to um, thank um, and recognize all of the department directors who all came in under budget last year, which is fantastic. Um, again, we are still refining this, um, but this is a positive overall picture. We're up on revenues, under on expenditures, so we'll really be refining that number for you uh, with the budgetary year end report like we do always. Um, but just want to note that that that's a um, uh, every department reacted very strongly and very um, diligently to the economic downturn and made a, a real effort to to control costs and and only, you know limit what they were uh, providing in terms of services um, as appropriate. Uh, next slide, please. 
Overall, um, trends uh, and expenditures are tracking slightly over than the accounting benchmark. So um, we have two benchmarks when we monitor expenditures um, because we're on a 12 month cycle. So we look at, you know, one out of 12, two out of 12, three out of 12 for regular expenditures, things good, like goods and services. For payroll, um, we look at, we have 26 pay periods. So we look at a different benchmark for that. So payroll's right on target. Um, accounting, uh, the regular goods and services are slightly over. That has seasonality in it. So we're letting that play out. Um, you know, if you pay, for example, in information technology, they might pay um, an annual uh, maintenance bill, uh, software maintenance bill at the beginning of the, you know, or early in the fiscal year and then not have that expenditure again for the rest of the fiscal year. So uh, it tends to, it tends to wash out um, throughout the year. Next slide. Enterprise funds, uh, good news on golf. And I don't have updated numbers on that yet, but because we were able to open golf and, and get it moving, and it was one of the, uh, we had some good weather. We had, um, I think not as an extensive, although it didn't feel like it, uh, especially on that one day that was really dark. We didn't have as much smoke over as long a period this year. Um, so we got a little bit more golf play and we're trending again. This is the colors trending up a little bit higher than we were last year which is a really great sign. We'll continue to monitor that. Um, but it, it does get very seasonal. Golf is very seasonal. So revenues play, they drop significantly with rain for obvious, obvious reasons, but we'll continue to, to, to monitor that and provide you the updates as the, as the year goes on. Next slide, please. Development Enterprise Fund. This is a, one of our major funds, but it is very, um, inconsistent on when the revenues come in and, and true you can tell you it depends on when they you know pull permits and we collect fees so it is a lumpy revenue uh that's a technical term we uh we're doing better than last year but you can see the variability there next slide please um in terms of the impact fees so this is your park dedication fees housing mitigation fees again these are project um uh, dependent um, so in last year, uh, we did, you know, a pretty typical year for impact fees. We were um, at or ahead in all categories. Again, this year it's uncertain um, how much we'll get in impact fees, um, but we are, you can see our budgets were projected based on known projects in the pipeline that were likely to pay fees. So we'll be monitoring that closely. Doesn't affect operations, but potentially does affect you know, some of the capital projects or, or other projects that we're investing in currently. Next slide, please. Utility funds, we'll continue to monitor these closely. Um, they are um, doing okay for now. Remember that while these percentages look a little, little bit slow, this is one of the ones where um, you all as Sunnyvale residents know you, pay, you get billed, we bill you bi-monthly. Um, so, we don't collect the bills for August and September or July and August until September. So things tend to lag. And then we do a, a revenue accrual at the end of the year to make up the difference. So you can think of utility revenues as shifted. Um, we'll try to normally normalize these in terms of our quarterly updates as we um, get closer to the end of the year and have a better picture of where we were. But we exceeded our revenue projections um, last year. Um, I do want to note that these are total revenues, and we did see a lot of development revenues in the water and wastewater funds. Those are connection fees, so um, you, do, you, you do have to keep that in mind. On the expenditure side, again, Department uh, Environmental Services did a good job. Those expenditures are under, so on all three utilities, and that's, that's great. So that helps our fiscal position, certainly. Remember, we did 0% rate increases, so they did a good job controlling costs. We're gonna be in a good position going forward from there. Next uh, slide. Um, so council had asked and was concerned about delinquency rate. Um, we are seeing a slight uptick in, in delinquency now that things are developing and have been over a longer period of time. Uh, my staff is currently analyzing um, you know, the, where we are specifically, but you can see some of the activity that we saw and we picked solid waste service fees. So I'll walk through this table really quickly to give you 
give you an idea. So you can see in 2019, of, for the whole year, we had five, for example, temporary stops. That means a business calls us and they say, hey, we want to suspend our service for a few weeks, right? Because whatever the reason, it could be any reason. It could be a remodel. It could be anything. Um, during uh, 2020, we had a significant amount more, and that was you know, solely due to the, to the um, shelter in place order and businesses not bringing employees to work. You can see a lot of businesses, a lot more businesses decreased services. Um, you can see we're starting, I'm moving from left to right, starting to get some resumption. There is a little bit of a mix uh, between resumption and starts because some um, get mixed in there with in terms of work orders. And then we had a lot, you know, pretty good chunk of, of businesses um, increasing their service back to where they had degreased it before. Um, where we're where we are right now is we do have um, about three. Where I'm still trying to get a final final number, but somewhere between three and five hundred customers who are significantly delinquent in their billing. Remember that we have thirty thousand connections, so that gives you an idea. Um, we are starting to work with those customers. We're reaching out to them, asking them what their uh, financial situation is, and I've engaged uh, Sunnyvale Community Services. Um, to, to start looking at how we can assist those customers if they are in a bad financial condition. Next slide, please. CalPERS on the expenditure side, 4.7 instead of 7%. Um, we're looking at two to $2.5 million annually as an impact from that. Um, so that's something we're definitely gonna be dealing with in the upcoming budget. We've just um, uh, started our work with Bartell and Associates to really get our arms around the cost for that, but that's our rough estimate uh, going forward. Next slide, please. Um, so we do, we are watching the permanent shift in the economy. So we wanna be careful about that. We did build a permanent shift in sales tax into the long-term financial plan. TOT we have recovering over the next three to four years more aggressively. So we'll have to really um, you know, continue to monitor that. It's still very early. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of political volatility. You can see in the market, the market was low. Um, it's now uh, up uh, a good a good percentage. I think the 30-year Treasury curve is up about um, 13 or 14 percent. Um, so we're we continue to watch that carefully. Um, continued economic impact of natural disasters. We're gonna um, be coming to you uh, once we settle out all of the work on the wildfire deployments and looking for an appropriation from council to cover the, the cost that's not covered by reimbursements. So we'll, we, that was something new that uh, we implemented the, with this budget and we'll be, we'll be following up on that. We do have the whole fiscal year to get that in, right? We just have to do the appropriation within the fiscal year. So I would expect to see that sometime first quarter of next year, uh, not, not anything before the end of this calendar year. Um, and then, uh, of course, we're seeing a spike in, in COVID, so we're uh, concerned about how that affects the, econo uh, the economy. Next slide. So what we're asking council to do tonight is just accept this report. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. We did uh, receive from the state $1.9 million in CARES Act funding, so we're uh, also looking for approval of budget, uh, budget modification to, um, to appropriate that funding. Next slide. And this summarizes that action. So overall, we're we think we're favorable right now. We're doing okay. Um, we're tracking as expected, but we continue to be cautious. Um, and again, looking for approval of budget modification number eight and uh, receipt and filing of the, the first quarter budget report. That concludes my staff report. I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Kirby. Uh, first up is Council Member Fong. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and thanks, Tim, for waiting uh, two meetings to get to this one. Um, so I think a lot has changed in our political volatility, but I, I get what you're talking about in terms of the market. I was going to say you could mark that one off. Um, nearly $2 million in CARES Act funding is great, and, and that's awesome. Um, how much, what would you estimate as the impact currently to the current fiscal budget of all the money we've spent to react to COVID, the, the losses in TOT, is, is it more than 2 million? Obviously, you, you know, you can't tell right now because it's not a whole fiscal year, but like if, if we go on the current trend, is it 
because there, I just, I'm just curious because you had this national debate about, you know, oh, if we do another economic stimulus package, some localities have benefited more than others that are disproportionately affected by COVID. And that's the real reason I'm asking it. I, I'm just really curious about that. Well, the impact of COVID is definitely more than $2 million. Okay. So on the expenditure side, it's, um, you know, at least four to six. And then on the revenue side, I mean, we dropped revenues uh, from 1819 to 2021 by almost 20%. So it's a it's a it's a big hit. It, it way exceeds two million dollars. Got it, got it. So that, that's great to hear. I, that's what, that's what I thought would be the case. Um, and then my last question is just or two questions because I'm trying to remember how we do business. So you mentioned in the slide we will have a end of the year report and in, yeah. in December. And then when you bring back the next, oh, this is an update to this report. Would that be at that would be at the study budget workshop on the 25th of February. We have it scheduled for January. So I, the strategic I planning session. Whether we'll do it at that workshop or not. We have it currently scheduled for a record, a regular council meeting. Oh, regular so council meeting. Okay. But one way or the other, either at the workshop or a regular council meeting, you'll get a second quarter update in January. Okay. My preference would be the, the workshop, but we'll see how it goes because we, we like meetings here. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, and then if we get to it by then, that's another question. So when we get to next year's budget, at what mark does staff say, okay, all these cuts we made in 2020, we can relook at and re-budget into the budget? I imagine staff would not do that for the next budget or even the next three budgets. But I'm trying to think, what is the measurement criteria that you are all using to make that decision? So for example, when we moved around staff in various departments in order to get the budget from, from those move, movements, at what point does staff say, okay, now we can, now I'm the city manager and I, I give authority to the department heads to, to increase their budget by X percentage? And maybe this is a question for Kent too. I'll, I'll start with an initial answer to that. And, um, there's really multiple things we would look at. So we would look at um, where revenues are at compared to budget. Um, and so, you know, I can say that up to this point, the positions that were frozen as part of the, the budget adoption by council, um, multiple positions were frozen for two years. Um, a lot of positions were frozen for one year. And so we built that into the 20 year financial plan um, if things look better than what was in the 20 year plan, potentially we could unfreeze things. One of the big factors we would look at is when do services get restored? So for example, you know, we froze a number of vacant positions in the library and even though the library is still providing services to customers, it's different and the library itself is not open. The senior center is not open. So part of it is the demand for the staff that provide those programs and in some cases, if we can resume recreation programs or senior programming beyond the virtual stuff that we're doing, um, there's a revenue component as well as additional staff needs that would have an expense. Okay, yeah, that's what I figured. I and, and you know what I kind of think of when you when you're when you're speaking is 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 vaccine and reopening <laughs> um, is, is the two major things that might be a catalyst for that. Okay, well, that concludes my questions. I, I'm really very appreciative that we've done a follow-up to what was requested at the last uh, budget session of having a, a fall update. So, so thank you, I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Uh, next up is Council Member Hendricks. Yeah, thank you. So Tim, in the utility fund um, delinquencies, are you mm -hmm. concerned at this point? In terms of a percentage of revenue, no. Yeah, in terms of in terms of if if they all ended up being delinquent, and we had to do something. Okay, no. Fine. Um, I'll just say, as it relates to Calpers, um, bummer. Um, you know, I, I'm not really thrilled about that two million dollars a year number, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I'll be interested to see how you're going to magically make that okay. <laughs> I'm running out of I'm running out of magic tricks, tricks, councilman. Yeah. Then really my, my macro question here, so if I'm looking at this from a policy perspective, um, the, the update's great, as uh, Mason just said, but I'm not seeing anything in this update that says, oh, here, we need to go ahead and pull on the levers and, and slow any spending down. 
And I'm not seeing anything that says, let's change the levers and raise our spending. It's, this is just kind of a good update of what's going on. And it's kind of, um, I'm, I take it as reaffirming all the other direction and changes that we made, and we should stay on the course we've laid out from our budget meeting. Is that kind of a fair way of looking at it? Absolutely, yes, that's that's an absolutely fair way of looking at it. Okay, so so it was a good update, but it doesn't tell me to change course. It doesn't, no. Okay, great, thanks. Um, excellent job by you and your team, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Council Member Melton. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Klein. The last question that Council Member Hendricks just asked was going to be my first question, which is, well, anyway, we, we heard what the question was, and uh, I'm glad to hear your confirmation there, um, Tim. So uh, I have a question, which is that in about a month, Tim, you're going to come to Council with the CAFR, and we're going to close the books on the previous fiscal year. And it seems to me that um, staff is going to present council with a general fund surplus of about $10 million. And the way I came up with that number is I'm looking at the chart about revenue being over the adjusted budget by $3.7 million and then spend due to the immense and Herculean efforts of all of our staff and the finance directors being under by about $6.2 million. And the sum of those two is about 10. Am I on the right track so far, Tim? You are. I just want to note that those are unaudited numbers that we developed, uh, you know, around the beginning of October. So they have changed, um, but they are still uh, um, substantially the same. Okay. I'll pick up on that thought later. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Uh, I see no other questions from council. Uh, so with that, I will open the public hearing. Since we remain in a virtual setting, I will ask the public to use the virtual raise your hand button or dial star nine on your telephone if you wish to speak. The city clerk will then ask you to unmute your microphone when it's your turn to address city council. City clerk, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay, I'll close the public hearing. Is there any further questions or a motion? Uh, council member Melton. Yeah, Mayor Klein, I'm ready with a motion when you are. Go right ahead. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna move per staff recommendation, alternative one, receive and file the FY 2021 first quarter budget update and approve budget mod number eight in the amount of $1,932,000 to appropriate CARES Act funding. Council Member Hendricks. Yeah, I'll second that. Yeah, I'm thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Hendricks for your second. Well, first and foremost, um, Great stuff to be getting just under $2 million on the CARES Act grant funding. Every dollar, every penny helps in circumstances like this. So uh, must be acknowledged appreciation for getting um, that funding. I also want to acknowledge, Tim, to you and your team, amongst all the other uh, jobs that you do in the finance organization and the regular cadence of keeping the city on track, uh, and the budget and the CAFR and all phases in between. We've now asked you to do this job as well with the quarterly update. It's important, it's critical for governance and I appreciate that you've added it to your um, docket of, of things that you're doing. Um, and just to, to reiterate the point that was brought up earlier um, is that what I take out of this report is that we're on track. We're neither going to increase spend from previous direction, nor are we going to take additional actions to decrease spend. Um, and so we'll see how things look at the next report. I'm, I'm very interested to see what the professional staff recommendation will be a month from now with the approximately $10 million um, budget surplus. Typically, staff looks at three levers. Uh, one lever is put the money in the budget stabilization fund. Another lever is put the money surplus in the CIP reserve. And the third lever that we often deploy is put money into our section 115 irrevocable pension trust. Um, what I'll say based on recent events with the good news that we got on the civic center bid is we're gonna be adding about $50 million plus or minus based on the bid below estimate um, into the CIP reserve. Um, so I will just express, I don't feel a need to be adding any part of the $10 million surplus into the CIP reserve. I'll just put that out there. 
Um, and then the big question then will become how much of the 10 million surplus goes into the BSF versus how much goes into the irrevocable pension trust. I'm sort of at 50-50. And the question is the more that we put into the BSF, the, the more sort of um, uh, pressure to increase spend we might um, incur from various constituencies. And so I would be a fan of putting at least 50% of the surplus into the section 115 irrevocable pension trust. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council member Hendricks. Yeah, I'll just uh, say also great job in the report, but since, you know, council member Melton has brought up what is going to be a future item. Um, I'm, and, and he's expressed his, you know, percentages and desires. I'm not necessarily at the same place. And I'll just go ahead and I'll, I'll be wait for that discussion we have then, as opposed to having it now. But I hope everyone uh, supports this motion. Thank you. Uh, and I'll be supporting the motion. Uh, definitely, Mr. Kirby, thanks to you and your team. As far as giving these updates, I think, you know, it was it's critical as we're looking for uh, the recovery going forward and making sure that, you know, on a quarterly basis where we have a good evaluation of, of where we where we stand from a city standpoint. And I know we don't have a crystal ball to see how quickly things will be changing, but it's it's that ever looking, you know, ever forward looking uh, focus that you and your team are doing, you know, keeping track of exactly where we are in the past and and trying to figure out what we deal with, working with the city manager, working with council to to put us in the best place as far as recovery is concerned. So so thank you for that. And uh, I'll be happily supporting this motion and and I agree with Council Member Hendricks. Uh, we'll, it'll be an interesting discussion when we talk about um, the final, the final revenues from 2019, 2020, um, and how they'll be dealt with. So I look forward to, to seeing what staff's recommendation is at that point. And with that, City Clerk, may we please have a voice vote? Yes. First up is Council Member Melton. Yes. Council Member Fong. Yes. Councilmember Larson. Yes. Councilmember Goldman. Yes. Mayor Klein. Yes. Councilmember Hendricks. Yes. Vice Mayor Smith. Yes. The motion carries 7-0. Okay. Uh, next up is item 20-0944. Continued from the October 27th, 2020 council meeting. Approve the master plan for public art introduce an ordinance um, amending Sunnyvale Municipal Code Chapter 19.52, Art and Private Development to increase the percent for art requirement from one to 1 1.5%, implementing option 2A of the Public Art Master Plan and allocating uh, $50,000 from the Public Art Fund to implement a utility box art project. Is there a staff report? Yes, there is, Mayor Klein. Um, Good evening, Mayor Klein, Vice Mayor Smith, and honorable council members. We're pleased to be here tonight presenting the master plan for public art and realizing the long-term vision of activating the public art fund and bringing more art to the community of Sunnyvale. Next slide, please, Dan. Tonight, we're gonna to briefly review the city's current public art program, the master plan process and objectives and staff recommendations. Next slide, please, Damon. As a result of the 1982 charter review process, the city established a trial arts committee and public art plan to guide staff in the acquisition of public art. Um, as a previous slide, David. Thank you. The original public art plan operated from 1983 to 1993. And when we talk about the public art program in Sunnyvale, we're really referring to two different programs art in public places and art in private development. Uh, next slide, please. Art in public places is funded through capital project allocations, donations, awards, and general funds, and more recently supplemented by in lieu developer fees. Next slide, please. Art and private development is where developers can choose to incorporate art into their projects or contribute an in-lieu fee to the public art fund. Next slide, please. 
Public Art Fund has a current balance of approximately $500,000 and has an impact fee. Public art funds are limited to creation of physical artworks in public spaces. Currently, we don't have a clearly defined process for determining how to spend the, these funds. Damon, oh, your, your audio is kind of fading in and out. Is there a chance you can move your microphone just a little closer? Thank you. Is, is that a little better? Okay, one of these, uh, currently we don't have a clearly defined process for determining how to spend the funds. One of the goals of the master plan is to identify a process for spending the public art fund. Next slide, please. How's the microphone working now, David? Good. Much better, thank you, Damon. Okay, thank you. So Sunnyvale has always envisioned a highly visible program aligned with city policy and residents vision there for their community. The plan's main objectives are to improve the overall public art program, update current policies, improve public art visibility, and potentially increase funding to match the community's and council's desire to achieve these goals. Next slide, please. During the master plan process um, that started around 2016-17 with an RFP, we brought a, um, some concepts back to council in June of 2019. And then again, we came back to the Arts Commission in uh, September of 2020, the Planning Commission in, um, oh, and we did a study session, I'm sorry, in August of 2020 with council. And we took um, all that we gathered from both the community engagement and the engagement with council and presented to the Arts Commission in September of 2020, the Planning Commission in 20, September again, 2020. And we're here tonight um, uh, before you, uh, November 2020. Next slide, please. The community engagement process, which included again, Council and the Arts Commission informed what became the master plan objectives. The plan identifies and lays out six main objectives to broaden the scope of the public art programs, enhance the management of public art, encourage involvement with the Arts Commission in the community, develop web-based and self-guided tour programs, incorporate a systematic approach to conservation, and to update Sunnyvale codes, policies, and procedures. Staff analyzed these six objectives and their strategies and created four implementation options two of which are not viable based on the current status of the city's budget and the elimination of the service level set aside. Next slide, please. Implementation option number one, maintain current art and private development in lieu fees and general fund contributions. And while option one provides for some minor general fund increases, the main goal of this objective is to generate a formal process by which to spend the current public art fund balance. Under the proposed public art fund process, staff will identify public art projects that maximize the city's ROI while minimizing ongoing maintenance and unfunded liabilities. Some of the projects can be taken directly from the master plan and some projects will be recommended based on general feedback identified through community dialogue. Projects will follow the same review and approval process as public capital projects, which is the Art Commission's review and recommendation to council for final approval. Next slide, please. Implementation option two expands public art through increased art in private development in lieu fee incentives. Based on staff feedback received from the 2019 study, session, we wanted to provide a couple of alternatives that would amend the existing art and private development ordinance to increase the incentive for developers to choose the in-lieu fee. So this would provide for additional activities by increasing the incentive for developers um, by either increasing the requirement for art percentage to 1.5% while maintaining the current in-lieu fee of 1.1 or option B maintaining the current art requirement percentage of one while lowering the in lieu fee option to zero, 0 0.75. Both options A and B may increase the contributions for public art, but would technically be unpredictable. 
Next slide, please, David. Unfortunately, as referenced earlier, implementation options three and four are no longer viable based on the current state of the city's budget. However, we've kept them in the plan for future opportunities and budget considerations. And those are three, to expand public art through general fund service level set aside contribution. And four was to expand public art through increased art and private development in lieu fees, as well as increased general fund service level set aside contribution. Next slide, please, David. The plan, along with the implementation options, were presented to council again in August of 2020, as well as the Arts and Planning Commissions in September of 2020. During the August council study session, majority of council supported option 2A, which would be to expand public art through increased art in private development in lieu fee incentives, increasing the art and private development art requirement percentage from 1% to 1.5%, while maintaining the current in lieu fee of 1.1%. During the September Arts Commission and Planning Commission meetings, the recommendations were the council's, city council approved the master plan for public art and introduced an ordinance amending Sunnyvale Municipal Code chapter 19.52, art and private development to increase the percent for art requirement from 1% to 1.5% implementing option 2A of the public art master plan. Additionally, um, allocating $50,000 from the public art fund to implement a utility box art project. Next slide, please, David. So tonight, staff is recommending that council approve the master plan for public art and introduce an ordinance amending Sunnyvale Municipal Code Chapter 19.52, Art and Private Development, to increase the percent for art requirement from 1% 1 to 1.5%, implement, implementing option 2A of the Public Art Master Plan, and allocate $50,000 from the Public Art Fund to implement a utility box art project. And uh, that concludes staff's presentation for tonight. And before we turn it over to the mayor and council for discussion, we'd like to take a moment to thank council the Arts Commission, staff, and the various stakeholder groups for their feedback and support throughout the process, and also the core team for all their hard work and passion for this project, particularly Community Service Coordinator 2, Kristen Dance, and Community Services Manager, Trenton Hill, and finally, the leadership support from Director of Library and Recreation Services, Sharice Brendel, and City Manager, Kent Steffens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first up for questions is Councilmember Fong. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Damon, for the great presentation. Completely agree with you. Thank you to all those involved, uh, especially city staff and our commissioners. Um, so I have a few questions. Um, I remember we were talking about this when we approved some of the art projects recently, but, but uh, and maybe this is a question for our city attorney, but can the council pass an ordinance that removes the authority of council to approve projects and just place it straight into the arts commission? Is, would that have to be a, a charter amendment or, or could that just be an ordinance? Uh, maybe that's to our city attorney. Um, possibly you could read, if council could um, give the arts commission authority to spend the money that is collected from fees. Um, well, I've not looked at it. The Arts Commission is created by ordinance. Uh, I don't. I haven't looked at the charter to see if there would be any prohibition. So I'd hate to. Uh, yeah, no worries. Yeah, I, I could look at it and get back to you if you like. Yeah, John, if you could add that to your list, um, that's just something I'm interested in maybe studying in the future. Um, moving on. Uh, so Damon, I know we emailed back and forth with our library director about the, the in lieu fee, which is I think the real meat of this plan. Um, and you mentioned that the average art cost percentage was uh, between 2013 and 2019 for when our consultant was looking at this was 2.1%. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm gonna <clears throat> go directly to the document just to here. Um, yeah, the average was 
And then I pulled, I pulled the uh, graph or the chart that we provided in the back and uh, anticipating a couple of questions around this. Um, so five of the 18 spent between one and 1.2, three of the 18 spent 1.33 to 1.49, and the remainder all spent over the 1.5. Yeah, I think I, I remember you telling me that for, those, for that time period of 2013 to 2019, eight out of 26 or 31% of the projects uh, went with the in lieu fee versus developer owned projects. Is that correct? Or private owned projects, I should say. So eight out of 26 chose the in lieu fee. Yeah, if, if I, I'm, I know that's in here somewhere, that sounds about right. Okay. So the, the reason I'm asking all these questions is our consultant originally recommended that we go with a 2% on site number with a lower number for an in the loo. And I see that on the pages 99 and 100 of the master plan that the cities of Los Altos, Sacramento, San Francisco, San Diego, and Ventura all have an on site percentage uh, similar to 2%. Um, and also, Los Altos is probably the most nearby city. Uh, has had it for a little while. When staff was working with the consultant and, and trying to pick the right number, did you all talk to the city of Los Altos that actually has a 2% number? Um, I think Chris and Dance and Trent and Hill are on the call. They were in at the early stages of the data collection. So I'm wondering if um, either of them are available to answer that question. Hi, good evening, Kristen Dance. Um, we didn't speak directly to Los Altos. We did a benchmarking. So the consultant may have spoken directly to them. I don't remember at the time, uh, but that is what they publish for their percentage. The, the 2% number, right? Yes, correct. So, so the reason I asked all these questions is because staff has recommended, and I know that this is because of the feedback that you got at the last study session, but. Staff has recommended either options A or B on, on uh, slide 11, 1.5% uh, um, on-site, 1.1% in lieu, or keep the current status quo of 1% on-site, 0.75% uh, 0, 0 in lieu. And since you mentioned that a lot of the projects are over the 1.1% or number already, if are not the majority near 1.3 or 1.5, it just, it's weird to me why a developer would choose to go to the in lieu fee of 1.1 percentage when all they have to do is spend the average that's already being spent at 1.5%. So my question is, do, if we went to the 1.5 on site and 1.1 in lieu, does staff confidently think that a lot of projects would move towards the in lieu? We, uh... Yeah, we, we don't necessarily think that it's something you can count on um, because it's, it's kind of matching the existing trend. <clears throat> Got it. So, so I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll be happy to advocate when we get to a motion because I, I want to focus on questions. But yeah, that's the question I, wanted my, I would pose to all my colleagues is, is if the goal is to push it towards in loop so the city can actually spend money and create projects, it, is the, what is the right ratio? Uh, thank you. I'll yield my time. Thank you. Uh, next up is Council Member Hendricks. Yeah, so I'll just follow on. I, I, with what Council Member Mason was just asking, I didn't realize the goal was to try and move us to in lieu. I, you know, I, I didn't, th I thought people were just trying to get more money. So I'd be, I, is that really the goal of what we're trying to do is to get projects to go to in lieu instead of doing it themselves? Uh, not necessarily. I think, I think the goal is twofold. Um, one would be, I mean, you know, the, the developers still have the prerogative of um, beautifying the properties that, that are developing and uh, in doing so, putting art on those properties. Um, it, it wouldn't, I guess, it, the, the, the bigger one would have been if, it, if, if it's a go, no go in terms of, you know, um, total property build out, parking lot, um, pedestrian space and, and, and everything all considered, 
it, if there's a tipping point in terms of putting it on site and or choosing to select the in-lieu, the, the real goal was, re, uh, you know, at the beginning of the project was to try to, you know, uh, find dollars to increase the public art plan overall. And it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just one uh, dimensional. Okay, thanks. And then you mentioned, you know, there's no clearly defined process of how we spend money. And maybe I missed it, but what's the process to define that process? Yeah, so uh, right now, uh, the only real uh, mechanism is, is within the capital, uh, the capital projects. Um, and that's when we, we could, you know, those projects that hit a certain mark um, that are internal and, and um, that are city capital projects then have an art component, but we've had this um, public art fund that's been building up over the last several years, and there's not been a real um, definition of how do we activate that, and then also priorities that have been set by either commission or council or the public, so I think this is a culmination of all that. But, okay, but I'm missing, so oh, by I'm improving yeah. the master art plan, are yes. we a approving you telling somebody to go make a process? Yeah, so the process would um, then be in line with the uh, current capital process. Um, currently, we're, we're, we're setting up a, a study session with the Arts Commission um, for both December and January to garner a list of projects and create a prioritization to bring those forward to council to um, seek funding um, to therefore turn around and and activate the process as which it it's outlined now, which is um, doing an RFQ, um, convening a panel, bringing um, art before the Arts Commission. Arts Commission then passing forward their recommendations to Council for the ultimate selection of art um, within the city. Okay, I, it, it just seems to me there's, there's something missing there because I, I don't, it, with what you just said and what would come in front of us, I, I don't know what the success criteria is of how we would, you know, there'd be a list of projects and we'd either just say yes or no. I don't know how I would evaluate or what the criteria was used for doing that. Um, I don't necessarily want to add that into a motion right here, but, you know, it just seems to me we're missing, to just say here there's a straight process that looks just at the the dollar numbers is losing something as part of the art process of what we might be trying to achieve or why you would prove uh, choose one project over another project you know would you choose three projects so that you could do more or do you one that's uses all the money i mean it yeah it just seems to me there's something else should be in that process yeah so, that's going to be part of the um the study session and dialogue with the Arts Commission is to identify like one of the a good example is we have several um, we have the 20 year park master plan and to and that as part of the renovation of each of the parks there'll be a, a art component just like we saw for Washington and we, and we saw for Fair Oaks so so to look at a list of things that came out through the study and also um, continually engaging the community and talking with Commission about projects that would um, maximize and or bring art to the to Sunnyvale. I, I'll just say you might want to try and reach out to all the council members separate of that because it sounds like you're going to define a whole bunch of success criteria without hearing at all what our opinions are and then you're going to come to us with a recommendation and you might not match up with where we think but I'll leave that alone. Um, I don't Indeed. have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Council Member Melton. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Klein. So, Damon, during the study session, I remember we spent a little bit of time talking about the concept of temporary art, temporary art. Can you tell me um, in this final document here where we ended up? Is temporary art a thing that will, you know, exist in Sunnyvale? Yes. Um, uh, well, it, it's something that we will put forward as um, and collections of or ideas of temporary art to be funded. Um, one is one one such piece of art or project would would be the utility box art. 
And within the document, um, temporary art is addressed in 1A. It's, it's, it's one of the subsets of uh, 1A, of objective 1A. And, and, um, and yes, that's, that's one of the things when we're talking about that we have permanent pieces um, tied to the park master plan, other buildings, civic center, um, uh, the, the branch library. There's a lot of uh, physical or large scale art projects that are set to come online over the next several years. So to look at other, other ways to integrate or to bring art, um, which could be affordable and enjoyable, um, but may not be lasting um, as, as some pieces uh, that you see around the city now. Excellent. So permanent art is permanent and temporary art is the opposite of permanent in that temporary, well, it's not permanent. So I just want to say from a policy perspective, the only thing I care about confirming with regards to temporary art, Damon, is that if we come up with a process where somebody puts in temporary art is that it must have a removal date stipulated. So can you tell me in the package that we're approving tonight is the concept that I just laid out that temporary art must have a removal date? Is that contemplated or not contemplated? It's not contemplated in the plan itself. Um, a good example would be the um, murals that we did for the state of the city more recently. And when we go, it, it becomes part of the actual call for artists and the art agreement between the city and the individual artists and in generating the artworks themselves. So it's on a more of a case by case and project by project basis. So we actually write it into, it was written into that particular project that those artworks were considered temporary and that, um, and that they wouldn't become permanently accessioned into the city's works. Right, and in all of that, Damon, did they have a removal date stipulated? We did not place a removal date on those particular works because we were hoping to use them um, flexibly um, for, the, for that particular one. Like we wanted to use them for the state of the city, maybe have them up downtown, maybe move them around, but it could, it could conceivably have that added as part of the agreements and call for artists, yes. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna just keep banging this drum a little bit more, Damon. So it seems to me for like, if somebody wanted to do temporary art on a utility box that you mentioned, right? That's not going to be moved to another utility box, right? If somebody wants to paint something on a street via an encroachment permit with whatever political message they may want, it's not going to get moved to another street. So if I can elaborate, if it's, you know, temporary art that is not intended to be permanent and cannot be removed or moved to another location as a point of policy, I want that kind of art to have a removal date that is not negotiable. And when the date rolls around, the street gets cleaned or the utility box has the art removed or whatever. So how do I get to that point tonight, Damon? Do I need to give direction to staff via a motion to you know, come up with this plan to ensure that temporary art has a removal date or what do I need to do? I can add uh, on that briefly. Um, in all of the temporary projects that we have done, um, the city attorney's office, and John, you might be able to speak to this also, but we do address that. That is included in all of the artist contracts. We don't necessarily, some projects may very well have a defined date of removal. It would depend on the project. Um, the temporary murals that we did, those murals became the property of the city with no attachment that we had to display those in perpetuity or hold on to them for any amount of time. So there was no specific date included, but there were provisions in the contract that we we were not locked into having to um, display them for any given amount of time. Okay, thank or you. Or good news. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Steffens, do you have any additional thoughts on what I need to do to achieve my policy objective? Yes, um, you know, it, I think what staff has spoken to has been our past practice 
And I think if you want it as a council policy, my suggestion would be to include it in a motion so that the master plan itself speaks to that it is a policy that when temporary artworks are are created that they be uh, the approval process include an installation and removal date. So I think that can be included in the plan that would give us long term direction. If the council wanted to adopt that we could just add that to the, the art master plan itself. Okay. Thank you for that to um, whichever of my colleague will be making the motion tonight, because it's not going to be me. If you could kindly include that into the motion, I think that would be fantastic. Thank you. If I could add just one thing, I think Kent's comments absolutely right. I'm just not certain if it needs to be stated in one place because I, I was searching for temporary. It may need to be inserted in different places. So it should be wide enough that staff is to direct it to insert the, the, the language that Kent was uh, recited in, in appropriate places within the master plan so we don't inadvertently miss something someplace. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Council Member Hendricks. Yeah, I just wanted some to get a little bit of clarity or maybe make what Russ was just talking about a little bit more complex. I didn't view the utility box art as temporary. Now, I assume you're calling it temporary because at some point, you know, five or 10 years down the road, we might paint it over, right? So whenever you're trying to address what Russ's concern is, I think we need to be a little bit, there maybe needs to be more clarity of the definition of what the, the simple distinction we're trying to make between permanent and temporary. Because like I said, I think if I'm understanding you, Russ, you weren't trying to say the utility box projects, if we did that, those had to have a removal date. I think you were probably thinking of other things, but you use that as an example. So, so that's just my thought on that. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and yeah, I was a little surprised, Damon, when you considered the utility box projects as temporary. I think in most, in most cases, it's, um, permanent until replaced. And I think that's what and I know I gave you several examples um, six months ago, a year ago on, on uh, uh, the utility box programs in other cities. And I'm not sure um, from, that, from that standpoint, you know, what, uh, what their consideration is from a utility box program um, standpoint is. But, but, you know, at least from my, at, at least, you know, from my perspective, I looked at temporary uh, projects as exactly what staff has done with the, with the murals downtown is it's an art installation that pops up on a specific street, um, conceivably larger, larger scale sculpture or something of that nature, and then is moved at some point torn down uh, when you're starting to paint. And some of the examples of, of temporary art that was in um, the staff report, I uh, was talking about benches and other things. When you're painting uh, or adding art onto existing structures or, or existing um, sidewalk utility uh, equipment, I think that becomes to some degree um, semi-permanent. So I, I'm not sure if, if it's the shall be, shall be there until decided. And, I, and this is the thing I hate to, to um, figure out what, how we want to change the, the master art plan uh, from a motion from the dais right now as far as what temporary art is. But I do think that that, you know, I, I was surprised that, Damon, that you considered that as temporary art. I, I just wanted to clarify that from your standpoint. Is that how you see the utility art program or no? Well, the, the quality or the, the actual artwork has a shelf life being out in the, in the weather even though it's in one fixed place. So in three or five years, you'd either need to have the same artist come over or we'd be, it depends on if we, how we apply the process, whether it's wrapped or painted. So you'd either have to have it repainted or it'd be completely painted by a, a different artist, which would be neat because then it would be almost rotational in a way that this one piece that was painted wasn't there now forever. So, um, it, it temporary 
doesn't, <laughs> uh, it doesn't mean it's a year, six months or whatever. It just means it's not, it's not forever. So, um, okay. yeah, it's, it'll be, we'll have to work on, um, we'll work on updating the, the document to, uh, have some, some flexibilities, um, or, or, and, or write in, you know, that the nature of temporaries will come up with something, uh, that I think, I think we can come up with something that will meet both council member Melton's and, um, and the other suggestions that we're hearing tonight. Okay. Thank you very much. And then as far as, um, <clears throat> there was a, there was a comment as far as the gallery was concerned. And, you know, when, when you saw, when I saw that there was an estimate and this was the concept of reinstating the gallery that closed in 2005. Uh, and it was $10,000 to initiate kind of set it back up. But I was actually surprised that that staff was estimating $50,000 for an ongoing annual expense. And can you clarify what that basis was? Because I saw it as um, installation conceivably by an art club or neighborhood associations uh, in, a, in a fixed space. And it's just opening that space up and closing it on a, on a daily basis. And so I was just trying to get a better idea of, of the $50,000 basis. It's, um, it has a lot to do with the staffing of the um, gallery and the, um, the shows. Uh, so uh, we, we, did, we tried to do a price breakdown on having the gallery open for a certain amount of hours. And when would the gallery be open? Mostly when people, <clears throat> um, so it'd be after hours. We, did, we looked at seven days a week. We looked at Thursday through Sunday in the evenings, on the weekdays, weekends, what are the hours, um, looking at what other galleries were running. And then also the, um, and there's other incidental costs associated with it. Um, the marketing involved with when you launch a new, whenever you launch a new show um, and some other, some other um, incidents, but it's, it's really largely wrapped up in staffing and. Okay, and, and that's what I was wondering is I thought it, I thought it would have been unstaffed as opposed to staffed. Um, and I understand it's part, there's marketing costs and other things. Uh, and it's, there's a cost of opening it up and shutting it down on a daily basis. But I would have seen the hours of operation as mainly unstaffed that, that you know, <clears throat> video camera in today's world of video cameras and other things, you know, that, that would have been the way of, of kind of protecting that equipment, that, those art installations for whatever they are. Yeah, I, I can clarify on that just to add in the fact that the, the gallery when it was open um, was staffed on a daily basis by volunteers. Okay. There was staff time behind it to curate and oversee the contracts and oversee the groups that were hanging things in the gallery um, because you run into issues of if we bring in a club to hang it up um, or put in what they want to put in there, we have to have some kind of control over what's going in there. So there was also, you know, staff time to make sure that the staff was, the, the show was getting installed properly, that the alarm was working. When the gallery okay. closed down in 2005, there was, a, I think it was a $36,000 budget associated with running that program. Great. Thank you very much. That, that clarifies it for me. And I think that was all my questions for now. Uh, Council Member Melton. Yeah, hey, thanks, Mayor Klein. Um, let me just circle back for a few seconds on the notion of temporary art. Um, and I can give some examples of where I think it would be the intent of whomever it is that's installing the thing that it is in fact intended to be of a limited duration, a short limited duration of you know six months or something like that. So there was the example on Java and Crossman when Google was removing some trees and they had the inspiration to paint the tree trunks and primary colors. There's no way that they would have expected that to become permanent. So all I'm saying is if that was ever part of a formal process where everybody knows going into it, Damon, that it's not going to be for more than three months or six months that we just write down the date on the tree removal permit or the temporary art permit or whatever it is, 
if somebody wants to paint a political message on one of Sunnyvale's streets about whatever topic, and they get an encroachment permit, everybody knows going in that that's not going to be a permanent thing that lasts for 10 years. It's gonna last for two weeks, four weeks, whatever. And all I'm saying is in that situation where it's known that it's not going to be permanent and of a very limited duration, that's the sort of thing where we should write down the removal date so that everybody knows without question and there's no argument down the road about it. Um, so if that makes sense, and that could be worked into a subsequent motion tonight and then somehow massaged into the um, policy document in the appropriate places, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any further questions. Okay. Uh, so with that, so uh, I will open the public hearing. Since we remain in a virtual setting, I will ask the public to use the virtual raise your hand feature or dial star nine on their telephone to indicate that they wish to speak. The city clerk will then ask you to unmute your microphone when it's your turn to address city council. City clerk, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. First up is Sue Cerrone. Sue, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes to address the city council. Hi, um, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the council. It's been a long time coming. Um, I am right now um, the vice uh, chair of the Arts Commission and I want to make a couple of remarks in that regard. Um, the, it has been a long time since this process started. And I remember going to one of the first <clears throat> uh, outreach meetings that was held by the consultant. And I just want to say that um, I think that the staff and everybody did a great job of incorporating all the kinds of input that was given um, in, in many, many kinds of uh, contexts. And so I'm happy to you know, uh, support the objectives of the master art plan. Um, as, a, as a, just a resident, not a commissioner, however, I, I wish we had the money now to spend it's, it's hard to see that money sitting there and not being able to spend it in, uh, in lieu fees. But um, in my view, uh, one of the purposes tinkering with the percentages that developers pay or not uh, is to increase our in lieu uh, fees so that we do have more money for public art. We have got a lot of exciting projects coming up with the new civic center and uh, downtown and lots of things that are going to be uh, public, however, and that requires public expenditures. And that's where the public expenditures for art comes from, is from the, those in lieu fees by and large, um, as, as well as the general fund. That is what we have control over to increase would be uh, incentives to have the developers use in lieu fees rather than their own private art. Um, Council Member Fong uh, described that process pretty well, I think. Uh, there's an awful lot of things we'd love to see in Sunnyvale, and I hope we can get enthusiastic people involved uh, to get some of these things accomplished in the next few years. Uh, one of the things I personally am disappointed about is I wish we could have that $50,000 that we're gonna spend on utility boxes to open the art gallery. I think that would be a much better use of those funds. Um, that's my opinion. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. Mr. Mayor, that was the final speaker on this agenda item. Okay, I will close the public hearing. Are there any further questions or a motion from my colleagues? Uh, Council Member Fong. I have a question um, just on the gallery issue. So I, I kind of remember from our talks about downtown that the community room, um, the owners of the property are actually interested in making it an art gallery. Could the, the staff 
recall that discussion. Um, it might have been one I had offline with them, but I, I thought that was something that they were interested in exploring. Councilmember Fong, this is Trudy Ron, Community Development Director. There's no formal requirement for provision of an art gallery um, as part of the STC Venture project, um, if that's the project that you're referring to. Um, they, they could have a gallery um, and it could be um, uh, a business or it could be something that they do voluntarily, but there's no requirement. Yeah, okay. Uh, so it's not formal, but um, a, a group could, a, a group that is approved in their list could rent out the room free of charge for our city agreement um, and work with them if they approved it. Uh, although we are not requiring it and it's not an agreement between us, correct? Uh, that's correct. It, it would, it, it's really a conversation between the property owner and whoever wants to use that room. Great. Um, and, and Mayor, whenever uh, questions are done, I'd be happy to make a motion. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Hendricks. Yeah, I have a request. Could we go ahead and separate, whoever's going to make the motion, could it be two separate motions that we separate? Because I am not a fan of changing the dollar, you know, the 1% to 1.5, but I'd like to be able to vote yes on the 50K item. So if whoever makes the motion um, could you know, we could do those two separate motions. It'd just be a little bit easier for me. Otherwise, I might probably have to say no to everything. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Fong, motion. Yeah, so I'd like to make two motions. The first motion um, is to uh, approve alternative three for the 50,000 for the utility box art project and a change to alternative one, including Council Member Melton's recommendation of amending the master plan to require temporary art to have dates certain of expiration when approved. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may, could, uh, for yes. procedural purposes, we should make one motion a second and vote on it and then make the second motion. That, that was for one motion, yeah. That's, oh, that's all oh, one motion. Yeah. Though. Okay, I got confused and thank you. Okay, Council Member Melton. Yeah, I'll second. Councilmember Fong to your motion. Yeah, uh, really quickly, I, I, I thank Councilmember Melton for pointing that out. Um, I think it's a stipulation that, that is required. Um, we wanna make sure that the city can actually enforce uh, when there's a temporary art project, whether it's verified through a process or not. Um, and I think the $50,000 for the utility box art project, we can use that uh, to, to get that done. I actually worked on a few projects in, in District 1 in San Jose through Art Box San Jose. Um, which is a nonprofit that does it. They need all the help they can get, but hopefully we can uh, keep our program going. And I hope my colleagues will support. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Hendricks. Yeah, I'm just confused. So is, is this motion doing the one to 1. 1.5? No, it isn't. Okay, cool. So it's just, doing, it's just doing number one and three, approving the art master plan and allocating $50,000 for- Okay, no, okay got it, thanks. Okay, uh, Council Member Melton. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. I'll be supporting the motion. By the way, I heard it was alternative. The motion is alternative one with a twist. Yes. The twist was the piece about the temporary art and also alternative three. Um, so I'll be supporting the motion. Um, thanks, Mason, for throwing in um, the bit about the temporary art. That's awesome, and I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to seeing the utility box art project. I don't know exactly where this is all going to go, but more power to Sunnyvale. And I'm just looking forward to it. So I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll be supporting the motion. Uh, definitely, I'm happy to finally see this come in front of us. You know, it's been, it's taken a while. Uh, and I appreciate all the staff's time and what the, what the art master plan has finally become. And I do think, you know, I, I appreciate um, our, our residents' um, uh, feedback as far as a, a utility, as a utility box program, and they'd like to see the gallery open. That being said, I do think that, that the utility box program will spread art throughout our community. And I think it has a lot of value as far as that's concerned. You know, the, the Sunnyvale Art Club is already utilizing several locations within the city and putting up uh, art, um, different locations like 
the bean scene like several other locations where they're, where they're utilizing their members' art and, and putting that up. Uh, I do think that a gallery would be something very nice to have in the long run and hopefully the City Line project uh, will have that uh, capability to some degree. Uh, for, from my standpoint, you know, I think that you know, what we're doing here uh, and it's, it's hard to, to uh, value art at the end of the day, but I do think, you know, not having it in our community is, is a big loss. And so it really does nurture people. They do like to see it. And the concept of having something temporary, having something more mixed throughout our community is a big plus um, as far as I see. So I'm wholeheartedly uh, and endorsing this and hopefully all, all the other council members will also. Uh, with that, uh, City Clerk, may we please have a voice vote? Yes. First up, Councilmember Hendricks, how do you vote? Yes. Mayor Klein? Yes. Councilmember Larson? Yes. Councilmember Goldman? Yes. Councilmember Melton? Yes. Vice Mayor Smith? Yes. And Councilmember Fong? Yes. The motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Uh, next up, Councilmember Fong. Thank you. Uh, for the second motion, um, I would like to motion that, I'm trying to find my language here, that we change the private development in lieu fee incentives by setting the art on site, the private development art on site requirement to 2% as recommended by our consultant and the in lieu percentage to 1.1%. And if I had a second, I would be happy to explain uh, the motion. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Larson. I will second that. To your motion. Yeah, thank you, Council Member Larson, for the second. And, and actually, thank you to Council Member Larson for being the one who pointed this out at the last study session. I actually wasn't able to catch that when we were originally uh, receiving the study session back in September. Um, in September, our, our staff told us that the consultant actually recommended a 2% on site fee. And if you refer to Appendix B, on page 101 of 190 of the uh, master plan report, um, you'll notice uh, that it shows all the art and private development allocations from 2013 to 2019 and the actual percentage of what the projects either created on site or paid in, in lieu. Uh, there's only three projects out of the 18 that are below the 1.1% number. Um, Fair Oaks Avenue in 2019 at 1%, um, another one at 1.09% and 1.05% and all of the other ones above the 1.1% number. And that's how I came to the conclusion that the in lieu could be 1.1%. Um, my personal goal is to increase art in the city. Um, and as we've seen over the years, we've only had 300 to 400,000 in in lieu fees to be able to play with. Um, and if we're going to increase that number, we really need to incentivize uh, developers to choose the in lieu option versus the on site. It's great to have art in our, our business parks, but it's also great to have that development that's created uh, that, it, you know, that that is seen by the residents and, and has an impact to them at the local parks and our downtown and El, El Camino. So I, I hope that uh, my colleagues will support this and we can always reevaluate this percentage. Um, if it somehow has a, a negative adverse impact on development uh, of any type, uh, and I hope my colleagues will support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Hendricks. Yeah, um, so I appreciate what um, Councilmember Fong is trying to do, but I'm not going to be supporting this motion. I wasn't going to support the motion and changing it to 1.5, and I won't support it going to 2. Um, and then there's really a second concept that's been brought out here, which is that we're trying to change the ratio of what is, you know, projects, you know, developments to do projects or art on site versus giving the money to us to go ahead and do projects, presumably somewhere else in the city away from where those projects are. And I'll just go ahead and point out, you're trying to increase a pot of money that we don't even right now have a defined process for how we say to go ahead and spend the money. Um, so I, I disagree with both concepts of what are being proposed here, which is I, I would have liked, I don't think we should be raising the, the piece right here. Just because a consultant says we can do something doesn't mean we should do something. 
um, sometimes we do more than what a consultant says. So, I mean, they're, they're a advisory piece of information. I don't necessarily look at them as telling us what can uh, be done. And again, I just, I don't know where this idea that came that said we want to change the ratio of what is art on site versus in lieu of money. So I'll just not be supporting this motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Melton. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor Klein. Um, I will not be supporting the motion, although I, I do get the arguments from the last study session um, where I heard it said that um, generally our developers are paying or um, spending a higher percentage for art that they come to own that is on their property and adds their own benefit. So I, I get it that they're already spending that amount. I'm just not a, a fan of increasing um, the requirement percentages in this economic environment, although I do support the goals of the um, arts master plan that we just approved to get more art throughout the city. Um, I'm just getting the feeling that this is um, taking an opportunity because we can to increase a fee. Um, and I don't see the clear pathway to exactly how or the means that it will be accomplished. And for those reasons, um, with respect to the maker of the motion, I'll be taking a pass on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Larson. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to speak to my support for the motion. Um, just you know, based on the data that uh, is in the report about what uh, developers are actually spending, I think that a small change to the requirement would basically have no effect. There, there's no, no point in doing that. Um, so if we're going to make a change, I think it needs to be um, higher than the 1.5% the that we've discussed before. Um, but um, there's still the in lieu option. Um, and so that, um, that's not being raised to, to this higher level. So um, I, I think, you know, given um, the current economic environment, then perhaps the uh, in lieu fee would be more attractive. Um, we're, we're not uh, really changing that. It's um, we're just changing one side of the balance between uh, these two. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I'll second what you said, uh, Council, Council Member Larson. You know, from my standpoint, I do think that that this provides a certain amount of flexibility for a developer. And you know, as as was uh, talked about previously. You know, raising this percentage uh, is uh, for 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 a lot of developers doesn't matter because they want large pieces of art on their property. Uh, I look at this in lieu fee as much of our much like our other fees that we have. So so when we talk about park mitigation fees or or housing mitigation fee or housing uh, mitigation fees, we're not sure how we're going to spend them immediately, uh, but and part of creating this art master plan is trying to figure out uh, art, which is something that we want in our community in the long run, trying to create a, a larger um, fund in the city for, from a city standpoint that we can then spend on different art installations and other art projects. As we see, you know, doing, there, there are yearly costs depending upon what projects and what programs that we handpick from the art master plan in the long run and getting our, our art commission involved in trying to figure out what priorities that they want, whether or not they're temporary or permanent is part of this part of that long-term vision. But if we don't have money, if we have basically, you know, a fund that we're slowly depleting and it's not being, you know, reinstated in any way, then we'll, we'll basically, we're always looking at how much money we have left. Well, it'd be great to start that art gallery, but you know, in five years we'll have depleted or 10 years, less than 10 years, we'll have depleted the money in the, in the art fund. And so we won't do that. And so that will, that will you know, make hard, harder decisions. So I do think that this provides a certain amount of flexibility for the developers. And you know, I do, I thank um, council member Fong and, and Larson as far as setting that percentage a little bit higher than, than what staff wanted, but it's exactly what was recommended from the, from the consultant. So I will be supporting this motion. And with that city clerk, uh, please have a voice vote. 
just a, a quick note. I just want to confirm that that change would be an adoption of an ordinance. Is that correct? Is that amenable to the makers of the uh, motion? <laughs> so yes, that we'll incorporate that into the text of the motion and then I'll read the title of the ordinance. Yes, please read the, the ordinance title into the record. An ordinance of the city council of the city of Sunnyvale to amend chapter 19.52, art and private development of title 19 zoning of the Sunnyvale municipal code relating to public art requirements for development. And then for the voice vote, first up is council member Larson. How do you vote? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, yes. Council member Hendricks? No. Council member Goldman? Yes. Council member Melton? No. Council member Fong? Yes. Mayor Klein? Yes. And vice mayor Smith? Yes. The motion carries 5-2 with council members Hendricks and Melton voting no. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next up is item 20-0842, adopt a resolution amending section 7.12, administrative citations, late payments for neighborhood preservation and fire prevention code violations, and licensing permitting non-compliance penalties in the fee schedule and provide an overview of the neighborhood preservation process improvements. Is there a staff report? Yes, there is. That was certainly a mouthful, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, it was. Yes. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor Klein, Vice Mayor Smith, and members of the City Council. I'm Christy Gumbelson, Neighborhood Preservation Manager in the Department of Public Safety. At the July 28, 2020 City Council meeting, Council approved a resolution to place delinquent administrative citations on the Santa Clara County property tax roll. As part of the discussion, Council expressed concern that the late payment penalty accrual rate of 10% per month was too high. Staff reviewed the master fee schedule and determined that the 10% per month rate also applied to fire preservation fire pre prevention and licensing permitting non-compliance penalties. This rate is particularly high compared to other non-payment penalties imposed by the city. Staff recommends that council adopt a resolution amending the fee schedule to reduce the late payment penalty rate of 10% per month to 1% per month for neighborhood preservation fire prevention, and licensing permitting non-compliance penalties. As part of the same agenda item, council also expressed concern for property owners who may have may ha be unable to correct code violations due to hardships such as advanced age, disability, mental illness, or limited financial resources. In response to these concerns, neighborhood preservation implemented process improvement strategies when citations reach $1,800, staff reviews the details of each case with a special operations, count, operations captain who provides input on the next steps of the compliance process. Also, staff is working with a variety of community-based organizations to potentially assist property owners who are not meeting compliance due to hardships. Some of these organizations include Sunnyvale Community Services, Heart of the Valley Services for Seniors, Rebuilding Together, and Council on Aging Silicon Valley. City resources also include Department of Public Safety officers specifically trained in crisis prevention, Senior Center case managers, the Housing Division for access to rehabilitation loans and grant programs. The primary objective of the Neighborhood Preservation Program is to resolve code violations through education and voluntary compliance. Staff attempts to work cooperatively with property owners at all stages of the compliance process. Citations are only issued after repeated attempts at voluntary compliance have failed. This concludes my report and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of staff? Uh, Council Member Hendricks. Yeah, so I kind of have a process question and Kent, maybe this is for you. So I remembered this item at our council meeting 
And I don't think we made it as part of the motion that said we wanted to go ahead and change. So how did, you know, the fact that some number of council members said they wanted the, the fee amount changed become, I didn't remember from that conversation that staff was gonna be coming back and making the change. Because if I had known that was happening, I might've argued against that. So can you tell me about process, how we got here? Sure, um, after that meeting, um, I felt as city manager that the 10% per month was excessive and I decided to work with staff and public safety to bring this forward for council consideration. So it was my decision to bring this forward. Okay, cool. Then as part of changing this, that these fees and stuff of what's there presumably is to try and help um, ensure compliance. So do we have any idea of if we change the number from 10 to one, is that going to improve compliance? I, let me let me chime in on that. And um, you know, when I thought about this and when I looked at it, what should drive compliance is the penalty. It's the fine. And right. what we do is we're not changing the fine amount. We're paying. We're changing the amount that accrues as interest or a penalty for not paying the fine. So if you get a code violation and you're told you must correct it by a certain date or you're going to be fined and you don't correct it, you can be fined a second time, a third time, a fourth time. And so part of the process would be to, you know, look at that before it racks up too much. But I think that's the compliance mechanism. A penalty for non-payment is a collection mechanism. It's not a compliance mechanism. And so I felt we should separate those. And I think the probably the intention was, hey, this is going to help correct the violations. In reality, I think it, it just it may help with collections, but I don't think it, it gets compliance. Oh, so, so I'm glad I asked this question because that actually changes my whole perspective on this. So the fine piece, that didn't change if, if right. you don't do it. This is just on that if you, it's almost another piece that says here, you didn't do it, we find you again, and we're charging you interest on top of that. Yes. Okay, okay, so, okay. I, I'm gonna say that was my fault. I didn't read the report correctly because that, actually clarifies a ton for me. So thanks, I'm all now all on board. And I also wanted to say, I like the process improvement piece that said here of what we're gonna do that once somebody's got one of these challenges, what we can do to try and help work with them to get something done. I, I, I Before you even made your other, I was wholeheartedly um, with that, but I'm glad I asked this question because you clarified everything about this. Um, I'm ready to move ahead, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no further questions, I will open the public hearing. Since we remain in a virtual setting, I will ask the public to use the virtual raise your hand button or dial star nine on their telephone if they wish to speak to council. The city clerk will then ask you to unmute your microphone when it's your turn to address city council. City clerk, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? No, Mr. Mayor, no members of the public have raised their hand indicating a desire to speak on this agenda item. Okay, I will close the public hearing. Are, are there any further questions or is there a motion? Council Member Hendricks. I'm ready to make a motion. Uh, I think go right ahead. Okay, I'm gonna move uh, alternative one, adopt a resolution amending section 1.2 administrative citations of the free schedule to reduce the late payment penalty rate of 10% per month to 1% per month for neighborhood preservation and fire prevention code violations and licensing permitting non-compliance penalties. Um, and find the action is exempt from CEQA pursuant to 15378B4. Council Member Melton. Second. To your motion. So I, I was gonna have all kinds of problems with this, but I'm glad I asked the question and thank you city manager for explaining, you know, Glenn, you need to re read the report a little bit better because um, it does clearly state it the way you're saying. Um, and I think this makes a ton of sense of what we're doing um, to try and go ahead. We're still trying to get compliance. This is just on this other P piece of um, fee, um, getting collections done. And I also really like the, um, the process improvements of trying to actually work and, and putting strategies in place to help people get to um, compliance of what's going on. I hope all my colleagues can vote yes on this. And to staff, um, thank you very much. And, and to you, Kent, for what you did. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll be supporting this motion. Uh, definitely, the this is a process improvement. And uh, I think you know, as, as the city manager said, it was, it was um, 
after our, our June meeting, it, it, it became apparent, you know, of the penalty versus the, the fine sort of thing uh, that, that we were, because of a, it took a while for it to go through cor a correction process, we were, you know, overly affecting possible residents and, and figuring out a process improvement to handle those issues as soon as possible, I think was, was, is a great thing from, from a city standpoint. So um, I'll be supporting this motion. And with that city clerk, please conduct the, the voice vote. First up, Mayor Klein, how do you vote? Yes. Vice Mayor Smith? Yes. Councilmember Hendricks? Yes. Councilmember Fong? Yes. Councilmember Goldman? Yes. Councilmember Melton? Yes. And Councilmember Larson? Yes. The motion carries 7 0. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is council, council member reports on activities from intergovernmental committee assignments. Uh, does anyone have any updates? Uh, council member Melton. Yeah, thanks Mayor Klein. I have an update from the Silicon Valley Regional Interoperability Authority. Some good news, we're pleased to announce the completion of communication tower connectivity within and across the entire Santa Clara County. This system allows first responders in the county from all municipalities and jurisdictions to directly communicate during large scale events like Super Bowl 50 or during emergencies like the Gilroy Garlic Festival shooting. Putting together this system of 31 sites involving 22 public agencies and taking 10 years and $50 million to complete was the amazing work of the Silicon Valley Regional Interoperability Authority, or SVRIA. For much of the decade-long effort, the SVRIA's board of director has been chaired by County Supervisor Mike Wasserman, who deserves special recognition for his leadership. For the past four years, I've served on the SVRIA's board and have seen some of the challenges overcome by the dedicated and talented staff to get this system online. Back home here in Sunnyvale, special props are due to the Sunnyvale Department of Public Safety, which along with the Santa Clara Police Department was one of the first two agencies operational back in October 2014 on the Silicon Valley Regional Communications System or SVRCS. To learn more, please visit worldwideweb.svria.org. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no further comments. Uh, next up are non-agenda items and comments. First up, Council. Councilmember Goldman. Uh, hi, thank you, uh, Mayor Klein. Uh, a couple of things. One was I, I, we received um, a letter, a couple, a couple of emails uh, from um, Mr. Wesley Yu and a, re a very detailed reply from uh, City Manager Kent Steffens. Uh, there's uh, four properties that are um, for uh, you know, residential properties, but they're zoned industrial, and uh, they're in this kind of no man's land where the um, the commercial industrial place that owns 90 percent of the land in that area isn't interested in those four units, and they're they can't uh, because it's uh, not zoned residential. They can't expand uh, any of their um, house, their housing. And Mr. Yu was saying that he bought a house. He, he had no idea. He couldn't expand it, and it's 540 square feet. And his future wife is has nowhere to put her clothes. Uh, so they're in this kind of no man's land. They, they, they can't sell it as industrial. They can't uh, really use it as residential. Um, uh, Kent um, uh, said that uh, it would take a kind of general plan amendment, which seems really overkill, but I'd like to see if there's any interest in getting something started on this. Uh, these four um, residences are kind of in a difficult situation. Anybody? Okay. Well, Okay, that was the one thing. The other and, thing I and want- council, and, and council member Goldman, they can initiate that if they want on their own. Oh, they can. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry, I did not know that. There's okay, the other thing, okay, thanks very much. <clears throat> the other thing was um, 
I want to congratulate um, uh, Mayor Klein on winning election as the first elected mayor. I, uh, it's not mathematically impossible that uh, the vote could change, but uh, it's highly unlikely. So congratulations and I concede. Thank you. I, I'm sure you will do an excellent job and Sunnyvale is in good hands. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Smith. Yeah, I had a question for city staff, probably the city attorney, uh, regarding the request from the mobile home park residents regarding a moratorium. Um, I've noticed recently that California has issued a non-renewal moratorium for insurance for res residents of fire prone areas. Does the city have authority to temporarily um, uh, institute a moratorium for um, increasing the vacancy rates for the uh, mobile home park rentals, the space rentals? Um, yes, the city would have the ability to do a, a rent freeze moratorium on mobile home rents. Would it be possible to do, um, to do them for specific owners or would it have to be um no to, for, for equal protection it would have to be applied against all the mobile home parks i see and it well there was a little bit more i responded to the email do you do you mind if i address the second sure, component or are you going to ask i i i'm not saying no, just tell us what you found out i did ask about this earlier okay <laughs> and and so the issue would be for those uh, mobile home uh, residents who have long-term leases, whether a moratorium freeze would be able to stop the rent increases. And we believe that it wouldn't because of the contracts clause of the United States Constitution that a local or state law cannot impair the private uh, uh, contractual obligations between two parties. Um, and if I remember correctly, uh, the survey that we conducted with residents, I believe, said it was 85% uh, had uh, long-term leases. Uh, the other thing that we uh, stated in our response to Vice Mayor Smith was that um, if at some point when we engage in the uh, MOU negotiations, one of the th considerations would be whether we would come back for a rent stabilization ordinance. It could be a two-step process where the council could consider doing a rent freeze and then coming back with a rent stabilization ordinance. So that that would be another option. And I don't think I said anything else in my email going from memory. So if I missed anything, Vice Mayor, please um, have add it in. Yeah, so um, I think for now I have some questions and then there's another council meeting coming up but, uh, next week, as I recall. Uh, but it seems to me like the the concern is twofold. One is that the um, negotiations entering the MOU. You know, point of order, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Is this really something, it sounds like we're getting into a discussion that we're going to go ahead and other people might want to weigh in. And I didn't think this was a discussion time. Is, is this the kind of thing that should be here, asked to have it made an agenda item? I, I'm just concerned we're, we're, this is supposed to just be comments and we're getting into, you know, a di possible discussion of action. I, I understood. So I think it's questions. So th there's not going to be a, a motion at this meeting. I think. Um, I'm trying to clarify to see what, yeah, to the, to Mr. Mayor, to the council member Hendricks point, I am trying to understand the options or, you know, potential response from council to concerns raised by the by the residents. And I don't yet understand what possible courses of actions, if any, uh, would be um, possible. And in fact, was planning to ask if I decide that's warranted, which I haven't decided yet. Right. So go ahead, your next question, Vice Mayor Smith, or? So my next question was that my understanding of the of the residents' issues were that um, it isn't that that they're necessarily looking for um, their own contracts, but the vacancy for 
um, uh, for those that aren't in, in contracts, the new rates are rising so high that in some parks they can't um, sell their, they can't uh, sell their, I guess, unit. Um, and so the, the question I think they're asking is not so much to uh, override the contracts that exist, but to put some caps on the limit um, uh, for the space rentals from being increased. And uh, the other aspect of that is that should the MOU fail um, and there is no moratorium, the concern is that the some of the property owners may have raised the rentals uh, for the vacant spaces in the intervening six months. So council didn't, it's a gap in what council um, directed, is that correct? Mr. Nagel, I mean, that's how I, I understand it. So what the council did at the October 27th meeting doesn't, doesn't address this potential concern, correct? Now, the only direction that the council provided was for us to negotiate, to initiate the MOU negotiation process and then to check back in with council. Okay, so, so yeah, I think if there were to be action from the council to maybe fill a gap uh, regarding the, um, you know, the, the potential of further rent increases in the interim, um, what would that action look like from council? To, to agendize it obviously is one thing, but I mean, what would the, what would the agenda item look like? If I may, Mr. Mayor, that yeah. it's at that point, I think as uh, council member Hendricks was commenting earlier, we really are beginning to get into the, what the substance of it would be. Uh, the council's free, obviously, to agendize it. Um, I know that Vice Mayor Smith mentioned uh, another meeting next week. There would be no way that, because uh, obviously I misunderstood part of the question uh, or the question may have changed. Um, and we would not be able to do anything by the 17th. Um, it would be even a challenge to do it by. Uh, no, I mean. Let me be more clear. I would be, I would have another opportunity in the non-agenda items to ask to agendize it. Should you yes, know. yes. You any, any council member could ask to agendize any item and get a motion and a second and a vote at any council meeting. I'm not necessarily prepared to do that now. I'm just saying that I could perhaps bring it back during the non-agenda items next week after I consider consider the very real concerns that the residents have raised. And, and thank you, Vice Mayor Smith, but keep, keep in mind what um, the city attorney also said as far as this would conceivably apply to all and it's multiple things as far as vacancy increases as well as uh, possible uh, yearly renting or yearly space increases. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complex issue and I suggest that you talk to our city attorney at length on, on these items and, and of course the city, city manager. Any other comments? Any other comments from any council members? Uh, moving on, uh, city manager. Uh, just one quick comment, Mayor. I wanted to mention that um, over the past couple of weeks, we installed the new airplane noise monitor. So we have four new ones that went in uh, they're installed, they're operating. Um, we're testing the software. It'll be a publicly accessible website so that uh, citizens can see um, when flights go over and it actually, they can play back the noise from a particular flight, understand which, what the destination uh, was for that flight, the time. And of course it'll aggregate data over a long period of time in terms of how many flight operations there are at any given day or week or, or year. And so we're um, starting to test that software and we're hoping to have it available early in 2021. Great, fantastic. Uh, 
with that, uh, this meeting is now adjourned at 10, 14 p.m. I want to thank everyone for their particip particip participation in tonight's meeting. And luckily, we didn't go past 1 a.m. tonight. So uh, good job, everyone. Uh, thanks. Have a good week. And of course, stay safe, wear your mask, and I'll see you next week. Take care. Bye. Uh, happy Veterans Day. <laughs>